like old radios. This program was recorded on Monday, October 21st, in the year of our Lord, 2019. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. Or anybody else. Who cares? <laughs> From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Now here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. <sighs> Well, thank you very much, Rich. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 21st, the year 2019. Today, the panel will be talking about radio and television broadcasting back in the good old days. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. Now here's today's panel moderator, John S. Kuchelko. John! Thank you very much, Rich, and thank you all for tuning in. This is our October Harvest edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. We're glad to have you listening to us. I'm John S. Kuchelko. I'll be your host today, and... Uh, at the beginning, I'd like to acknowledge our regular host and moderator who cannot be with us today, but we wish him well, and that is our good friend John Red Ryan, better known as Jack Ryan. We always like to point out that Red does not reflect his political point on the spectrum, Jack Ryan. So if you're listening, Jack, your friends here at the studio wish you all the best. And we are here at the John DeVita Broadcast Center. We always warn people at the beginning, don't try to find us. We're in a highly defended location. This is an underground command post, a bunker, and you'd have to go through far too many checkpoints. The barbed wire is murderous if you don't know your way through, and, and uh, the guards. So don't try to locate us. We Just have, listen to a, us. We have a terrifying guard dog. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, and, and right. the guard dog is right here in the studio. That's our last line of defense. That's in the if backyard you, gate is hard you, to get through. If you yeah. get through all the gun emplacements and the, and the uh, fortified bunkers and barbed wire, that dog would stop you cold. We have, we, we ordinarily go around the table, but before <coughs> we do that, I'd like to introduce, we have two guests with us today, two special guests, because we're going to be talking about Chicago's role in broadcasting, and of course the city of Chicago played an important part in the history of radio broadcasting, and continues to to this very day. Uh, we have with us, uh, the first man I'd like to introduce is a retired radio broadcaster, or so I have been told, perhaps he can correct me on that. Not anymore. Dennis <laughs> Farrow. Dennis Farrow, welcome. Thank you. You're Thank here. you. Nice to be here. And we also have from WBBM, the CBS Columbia, they don't use the words, it was the Columbia Broadcasting System. Yes, it was. And I can remember when Andy Rooney said, you know, CBS used to stand for the Columbia Broadcasting System, but they changed that a few years ago. They just use the initials now. Today, CBS really doesn't stand for anything. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an introduction. And with that great introduction, and I, and I, I certainly don't mean that, uh, he is with WBBM. You may remember the great John Madigan, WBBM News Radio 78. This is Chris Habermill. Chris, glad to have you with us today. Wiping John Madigan's <laughs> remains off of my forehead. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Thank you for joining us. All right. And now, as we do customarily, we will go around the table and let each of our regular panelists introduce themselves. And I'll start with the gentleman directly opposite me, who is flanked by our two guests. Would you come in and sign in, please? It's, it's an honor to be opposite you. Uh, Don Peter from Oak Park, Illinois, and I'm a member of the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Thank you. And now the man at the, the head of the table in a, in a, a blue shirt sporting, sporting Chicago Cubs insignia. 
Uh, thank you, John. I'm Dennis Fitzgerald, retired Chicago policeman. And in my retirement, I head up the one and only police council in the Knights of Columbus with members from 50-plus suburbs and seven states. And uh, I always invite any and all to our website, knights12173.us. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Now I'd like, to, I'd like to acknowledge our announcer who is seated to my left. I always said he has a terrific voice for radio. Our announcer, would you please identify yourself once again for our listeners? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Richard Lang. I have a little background in teaching modern American and European history. But more recently, I'm involved in a group that recreates old-time radio shows under the auspices of Chuck Shaden, who helped us get organized a few years ago. That's a lot of fun. Excellent. A labor of love. No memorization required. Thank you very much. And now, to my right, but that is only speaking <laughs> geographically, I always like to point out, no one is to the right of me politically or philosophically. <laughs> but now let's go with the two gentlemen who are seated directly to my right. Uh, Tom McKenna, retired Chicago police officer, lifelong friend of our regular uh, moderator, John Ryan. Uh, I'm one of the few, few people who will actually admit to that. I'm also a member of the uh, Police Knights of Columbus uh, Lodge and uh, very proud to be a fourth degree uh, member of here, here. the Lodge. And now representing the Chicago Fire Department, last member of our panelists to identify himself. Bill Kugelman. <coughs> Retired from the Chicago Fire Department after 46 uh, short years, and also a uh, former member, uh, president of the Chicago Fire Museum, Fire Museum of Greater Chicago at 5218 South Western Avenue. And we are, uh, let's see, the fourth Saturday coming up, we yes. have uh, open house this coming Saturday. So uh, anybody that is uh, from 10 to 2 o'clock, anyone that's listening that wants to uh, bring their kids, bring a camera, and uh, look, what the, uh, look what the history of the Chicago Fire Department has for you. And uh, right now, I guess that's it, John. And it's well worth the trip. Uh, having, having been there, we once did a, a remote broadcast of our Meet the Chicago Historians from the Chicago Fire Museum. It's a great place to visit, a lot of interesting exhibits there. Uh, so I encourage you, if you have an opportunity this Saturday at their open house to visit the Chicago Fire Museum. Now we have one more gentleman we should introduce. Well, this, is, this program is devoted to the history of Chicago broadcasting, and he's played a co considerable role in Chicago broadcasting. He was the former station manager at the old WJJG radio station. And he is the commander of our John DeVita Broadcast Center. John, would you like to say a few words? Please? Yes, I would, uh, John. Uh, thank you very much. You know, uh, when you were just saying about um, uh, the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago at 5218 Southwestern Avenue, uh, we did a remote broadcast out there, uh, and that, that remote broadcast was October the 10th, the year 2011. We went on the air at, uh, at, at 12 o'clock noon. And at about 12.30, my dearest pal, Joe Gentile, passed away. So the day that we were broadcasting at the museum, Dr. Wayne Chukowitz called me on the phone and says, John, I've got bad news for you. Joe Gentile passed away. And like you said, John, I was um, in 2002, on March the 1st of 2002, uh, I was in, started getting involved with uh, with WJJG uh, on 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 on, the, on the Friday. Um, my mom had passed away at ten o'clock in the morning on March the first. Five o'clock in the afternoon, Joe Gentile called me and asked me if I could come and fix a phone that was not working in the studio. And I told him, I'm sorry, Joe. I says, uh, I, I'm on my way to make arrangements for my ma. She just passed away. And I said, but I'll be there uh, Saturday morning before I, before I do anything. And I was there at 6 o'clock in the morning, fixed the phone. And uh, Joe says to me, my God, he says, uh, you, you got to fix so fast. Says, How much do I owe you? I says, Joe, I says, let's make it, let's make it reasonable. Let's make it 25 years of friendship. 
uh-huh. and he took me up on that. And I was his station manager and chief engineer uh, from March 1st, 2002, until October the 10th, 2011. And uh, he was very good to me, very, very good to me. And I treated Joe just as if he was my adopted father. And I, I love, and just like I told Chris when he came in just a, just a, about an hour or so ago, there's two things that are very, very dear to my heart. Number one is radio and television broadcasting. And number two is the fire department. Thank you, John. Thanks for that nice tribute to Joseph J. Gentile. Of course, he was his initials gave the call letters of the old W. J. J. G. Joseph I, Joseph John Gentile. And I had the good fortune to start uh, doing this, doing doing some broadcasting at the old W. J. J. G. Studio, where John DeVito was the station manager. And I think several of us here had that experience as well. This program originated. Uh, as part of WJJG and has continued on after the sad departure of WJJG from the Chicago Metropolitan Airwaves. Well, you've met everybody on our panel, and uh, you've met, of course, uh, John DeVita, our host here. So uh, we're going to proceed now with our October edition (coughs) of Meet the Chicago Historians. We have a special edition uh, this month dealing with Chicago radio broadcasting. It's customary that we begin the first half hour talking about the news of the day, the news of the week. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any topic that they wish to present on that subject right now. I'll I'll kind of leave the mic open for a couple of seconds and see if anyone uh, has something they would like to speak uh, about. Let's talk about the uh, teacher strike. Very good. Um, I I posted something earlier on uh, Facebook that got a a very large response. I am a very strong union supporter. Uh, I, everyone in my family have been members of unions. I've been a member of three unions. Uh, but I posted, I have a tip for the teachers walking the picket line. Please do not wear designer clothes, <laughs> designer <laughs> boots, and carry Starbucks <laughs> coffee, <laughs> coffee cups. <laughs> it, it, does, it doesn't project the the sympathetic <laughs> image that you're looking for. <coughs> very good, Tom. Yeah, very good point. Very, very good, good point. point. Very but, good. but having said that, uh, my sister is a retired uh, Chicago public school teacher. Uh, the I sympathize uh, with the with the unions, but the it's 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 so tragic that the students that are being affected, especially the athletes that are going to be denied uh, uh, probably, well, soccer, I guess, is the first sport that's going to, if they don't settle by Wednesday, I think that's when they decide the uh, uh, soccer matchups for the state championship. And then uh, this coming weekend, uh, if it's if strike isn't ended by then, they come out with the uh, IHSA football pairings. So if they don't settle by then, all these kids, and, you know, I said it, uh, before, and I'll say it again, a lot of the reasons for, for these students going to school is, is music, art, and sports. A lot of them wouldn't be in school if it wasn't for those things. So if they eliminate that, it's going to be really discouraging. And again, it's going to affect uh, college uh, scholarships. And for some of these kids, it's the only way out of the neighborhood that they live in to get into college is through sports or, or music or the arts. Good so point, Tom. Good point. Right. I I would hope and I would think and, and as you know I've been through you know negotiations and strikes and and uh, I I would I would sincerely hope uh, I I think that they would settle that I don't mean the strike th- th- but settle it with these kids with their sports uh, scholarships and and so forth uh, I don't think the colleges are gonna are gonna you know uh, stand by and right. let these Kids go. Yeah, there, there, there's, some there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, uh, points th- that I mean, really, for a a well, a, let's let's just start with the grammar school. Some of these classes have over 40 kids in a class. I can't even imagine. I mean, I, I have seven grandkids, and when they're all assembled, I can't <laughs> I can't even control them, and I and I can I can actually yell at them. I, you know, now you can't yell at kids anymore in school, so I can't imagine, especially the lower grades, 
in grammar school that a teacher, and even if she's got an aide in the classroom to try, first of all, try to control 40 kids that age, l let alone trying to teach them anything. Right. So, I mean, it's a point that, I mean, I, I sympathize with them, and I, I, I just hope that they can come, come to uh, some agreement uh, shortly. I thought that they had settled that uh, back when Karen Lewis was the president. And you know, they went on strike back then, right. but uh, well, evidently not. Well, like my sister, she was involved in like seven different strikes in, in 40 years with the, the Board of Ed. But one thing that's going to be different this year is that they're not going to be making up the days lost during the strike. In the past strikes, the teachers, even though if they were out for five days, that they, they didn't lose five days' pay because they made up five days at the end of the year, whatever amount of days it, it, it was. Supposedly this year, that's it. These, what is it, three days now that they've been out? Yes, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. th those those days are lost. So what's well, the what's rational? What? Do you think for that, Tom? Not making up the days? I I don't I don't really know. Oh. I, I I don't think that there's any any uh, uh, anything to go by. You know right. th that it's something made up right away right. because uh, in 1980. Uh, you know, we were out for a long time. Has the Board of Education... Just, just oh, a minute. Me, we I thought you were done. And, uh, uh, you, you know, we, we lost that money huh. uh, when we were out. So and that's one thing that you just have to you know, realize when you go on strike. Mm -hmm. You don't get paid for being on strike unless right. your union has got a ton of money and wants to pay you. Uh, you know, and I took 97% of the firemen and paramedics out on the street. So it's, uh, you know, I, I guess these people are all out. I don't see any scabs uh, uh, well, you know, being complained about now. An another thing about the Chicago Board of Ed, while it's, you know, it's so many schools, you know, are underperforming, but, but f I believe it's five... Chicago high schools are in the top 10 high schools in the entire country. Whitney Young, uh, Near North, uh, Peyton, I forget what the other ones are. They're extremely highly rated high schools, while on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's some high schools that the, there, is, there isn't a student in the entire school that, that meets the minimum standards suggested by the... Uh, I forget what that program is that they came out with. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Haven't they offered them 15% over, uh, was it three or four years? 16%. Yeah, over five. Over, oh, five, yeah. five, and they want uh, 15 over three, I think. Given the financial yeah. situation of the state, of the city, city, given the fact that all of these, these uh, public employee pension funds are on life support as it is, you wonder how is it possible to, to grant more? I mean, well, we're, well, the obvious answer is that taxes are just going to keep taking more and more money away from the taxpayers. They, they said if, if it, it's not going to work. They said what the teachers are requesting, if, the, if it's granted, would add $415 to the average real estate tax in sure. the city. That's a nice chunk of change. So a teacher living in Chicago might get a significant pay raise, but that's all going to go to additional property taxes. Yeah, I'm maybe. sure some are taking that point of view, too. Sure. Yeah. You know, gentlemen, it is sad. When I heard this morning on my way back from Wisconsin that this is the third day of the strike. Now, who is suffering from this? Not the teachers, but the kids. So. Now, what's sure. going to happen now? Now, time you said now... They're not going to make up these, these days now, is that right? That's my okay, understanding. Okay, all right. Now, normally, public schools get out of school about about the middle of June. Now, if this strike continues on, they stand on their vacations to go on a trip or go somewhere, and they can't because their kid is tied up in school. It's not fair. It's not fair to the children. It's not fair uh, to the parents that, that these people are are, uh, uh, are are on strike. Now, I was on strike with Illinois Bell Telephone Company. Back in 1968, I was out for six months. Mm. And God bless my dad, God bless my father-in-law, that they were able to help my wife and I 
And at that time, we were just in the middle of selling a house at 5754 North Moody Avenue in Chicago. And we bought a house at 7437 Argyle in Harwood Heights. And we were right in the middle of the transition. And thank God for my, for my parents and for her parents that, that, uh, uh, that they helped us put food on the table and support my daughter and, and, uh, and, and to keep us going. I think everybody is in that same situation, John. Uh, uh, it's when the family has to stand up and uh, be a family, that, uh, help out. You know, it's uh, and, and something that you look for. And, and like I said earlier, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, both sides can be right, you know, about some things, and mm -hmm. both sides can be wrong about some things. It isn't, you know, a black and white issue. And unfortunately, a lot of people that don't like teachers or whatever, they use this as an example, you know, to badmouth the teachers and vice versa. Pro-union people show this and... You know, but I mean, it, it it's getting it's getting out of hand. They're they're turning this into uh, the teachers' union, is turning this into something other than it is. You know, they're talking about social 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 justice and homeless uh, issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and home homeless issues, and uh, it's it's uh, they're they're getting off track. You know, stick stick to the issues. I I know the the teachers. Uh, they pay two and a half percent into their pension. Police officers pay nine and a half percent into their pension. You know, so, so the fire. It seems to me that the, the it seems to me we don't hear a great deal about how much the average teacher is currently earning. They they don't seem to talk about that. They just say, well, they want more money. Well, it would be interesting to know what the average teacher is getting and what what it, not just the average, but what the the highest paid teachers are mm -hmm. getting and 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 what what the range is between the average. And those at the top of the spectrum, pay and how that compares yeah. to other cities are paying their and, teachers, and, and, and the people yeah. who are paying no. the freight, the can, taxpayers right. who yeah. are paying for it. I can answer that. Chicago teachers are paid well above uh, the mm. average. So if it, if pay is the only issue, then they don't really, they can't present a real positive case. But the other issues, like uh, cas uh, Class cl size, classroom yeah. size, yeah. they do have a legitimate argument yeah. there. And they want a nurse in every in every school and right. a, in a, in a, counsel a counselor, yeah. a librarian, mm -hmm. and, that, and that you know. You always meals do we serve in the school? Breakfast, lunch. <laughs> Is there a, in the third a snack or something like that? Yeah, well, that's. I mean, it's, some of these kids, if they don't go to school, they don't get anything to eat all day. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Sure, yeah. So, which which they are doing now for these kids that are on strike. The, you know, not not the kids on strike, but the teachers are on strike, uh, and the schools are shut down. But they they are keeping them open mm -hmm. for this food, right. you know, which I can see is uh, realistic because uh, what's going to happen to all that food? That's another. That's right. It's another uh, Has problem. The board of education ever been independent of the city, or has it always been pretty much run by the city, or have they had the last word? I think the the way in which it's administered has probably changed. I mean, how the school boards, whether they were appointed or elected, but I'm sure I'm sure from the very beginning, the public education in Chicago has been in some way connected with the city administration. Okay. I mean, with, with with government in in general. Now, how much direct control the mayor had over appointing them? I mean, that may have changed. I mean, it's, the city's been around for nearly 200 years now you know you're talking nearly 200 years since the city of chicago was founded in the 1830s so i'm, I'm sure the, the that's changed through the years but yeah it's always been a part well, of government i believe the largest portion of your tax bill goes for, oh for, by far for yes education mm -hmm. yeah anyone who checks their any property owner particularly live in the suburbs and, and in this i'm sure this is true in chicago as well if you check your property tax bill far more of it goes for the grade school, the high school, community college, then goes to the city government, city administration. And in, in the suburbs, that would be your, your city, town, or village, and the township. You put those together, the schools consume far more. Uh, rule of thumb I used to have was that the grade schools alone had a, a higher share of the tax budget than the, than the municipal administration. Hmm. And that doesn't include the high schools, which are often separate, 
and then the community college is out in the suburbs as and, well. And the, the taxpayers that send their kids to private schools, I know I sent my kids to private mm -hmm. Catholic schools. My parents sent me and my brother and sister to private schools. I mean, that takes a, a large uh, chunk of uh, money that the Board of Ed, even though we pay the taxes for it, right. We don't avail of ourselves so that. That's right. So in in essence, they were paying double for your education. Oh sure, sure. No. Any, anyone, any any homeowner, and even if you're a renter, yeah. if you if you're sending your kids to a private school, to a parochial school, Catholic school, you're paying double because you're paying all those taxes to support the public education plus what you're paying in tuition for your kids to go to a private school. As I was coming here this morning, I heard that Lori Lightfoot sent a strongly worded letter to the union saying. Both sides are making substantial progress. Let's end the strike. No, uh, I don't know what that's going to lead to. Yeah, they, Rich, I think she said that uh, four or five times already. She might have. This was supposed to be a strongly worded yeah. letter. Is it fair? Is it fair to look at the past, the schools that we attended when we in our younger years, <coughs> and to make excuse me, and to make the comparison, and and uh, the results of the product, the results of the kids coming out. Now, I mean, I know things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you always want to advance uh, for their professions and all that, but uh, it's a world of a difference from the schools that we attended to the schools that, uh, that are, are there now. Well, that's, one of the ar that's one of the arguments that's made by people who say, you know, in private industry, you have to show results. You have to, you have to, make, you have to persuade people to buy your product, yes. which means you've got to deliver a good product. And that's their argument against the, the you know the pu the, pu the public sector, and which includes the schools, is that there is no accountability. Uh -huh. That you know, they they continue to to maintain schools that are below par, and we just heard how bad many of these schools are. And there's there's just no there's no uh, judgment for that. There's there's no penalty for that. You just keep pushing kids through a, a failing educational system and demanding and demanding more money all the time. I can't know, do that in the private sector. I know my sister said that kids that were excellent students, she, she retired from Corliss High School, which is 103rd and Cottage. She said it, it was really unfortunate that kids that excelled at Corliss High School when they went to, you know, uh, any premier uh, college or university couldn't hack it. They just didn't have the, the skills. They were so far behind uh, in their educational level that they, they had to either uh, leave or they flunked out. You know, they just, there's no, there's no comparison to, uh, to a, uh, now again, some uh, Board of Ed schools, they, they turn out a very excellent product, but the majority of them don't. And that's unfortunate because that's, those, those are the tools you need to succeed uh, as you travel, travel the road of life, as they say. And if you don't have them, I mean, people can't, you know, graduating from high school and they're reading at a third grade level. It's sad. You know, where, where are they going to go to work? You know, so. Well, you can tell that when you get into a store, too, and you uh, want your change or you want to buy something and uh, they know absolutely that two and two does not make four. I remember. I remember when I was a kid working as doing checkout in my my parents' grocery business. And you had, you had to you had to calculate the change in your head. You had to determine yeah. what the change mm -hmm. was. The machine didn't tell you. Now every they just depend. The machine yeah. tells them. They it tells them what the change is. So there, and it, it's a, a lack of ability, basic abilities of of numbers and 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 they say you know. Uh, People are not only illiterate, they're enumerate in our society. They don't know how to use simple math. What a sad commentary. <laughs> well, that, that's why so many fast food places are going to uh, full automated uh, uh, right. tellers. You know? well, there and schools kids. aren't treating, teaching handwriting anymore. That might be no. a passing phase. No. no more cursive. Right. Maybe right. that's coming back but to some degree. Th th there is, I, I've seen stories that they are bringing that back, that schools uh, have recognized that it that it is a useful skill for for students to know how to write right. how to write to sign their name and mm -hmm. to write legibly and not to simply print so i guess i guess that that, that message has apparently back. gotten through there there is a revival of the learning of penmanship and handwriting i think we're coming up on yes, just yes, near yes. the end of our okay. first 30 minute stanza now it's time for a brief intermission 
You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. John? Hello, friends. Are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street, or call 708-383-3638. Phil Berry will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price list, NCR forms, sale sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And he also has one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And his complete binary service com includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, call or see Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. They are located at Madison Street and Clarence, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And that's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. Or give Phil Berry a call at 708-383-3638. For all your printing needs, the printing store is there to help you. There are 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. And once again, you can call Phil Berry at 708-383-3638. Now back to today's special edition of Meet Chicago Historians. John? Thank you, Rich. And once again, this is John Escachoco. We're at our October edition of Meet the Chicago Historians, and uh, we honored our tradition of spending the first 30-minute segment talking about news of the day. Uh, but now we have a special purpose uh, to talk about the great history of radio broadcasting in the city of Chicago. We have two special guests today, and I'm going to turn first of all to one of them, who is the former program director of a station, WJJD. Not to be confused with WJJ. G, of course, which was the original station of this broadcast, Joseph J. Gentile. This was WJJD. And some of you may remember when WJJD was a country and western station. Well, he's the man that changed that. So let me turn the mic over Ooh. to Dennis Farrow, who is still, I understand, still active in radio. His broadcasts are heard all over the world and points beyond. So and points beyond. You can even tune into late night Chicago radio. And hear it. Dennis? Uh, what happened with WJJD, Shearing Plow Broadcasting, was losing money. WJJD was rated number 40 in Chicago. And ra in Chicago, you have 52 radio stations. Did you know that? I was just going to say there were 39 stations. There were 52 they were radio 40. stations. You still have that many. And they were number 40. Mm -hmm. So I got a call from Shearing Plow to uh, come in and do some changing of the format. So we got rid of all the country and western. Sorry about all you people who like to hear about Mama got run over by the bus and Daddy's in jail. <laughs> That's my life. That's your <laughs> life. <laughs> I'm going to miss them. So anyway, we took Grandma the station. Got over by a reindeer. We have, right, exactly the reindeer. We <laughs> took the station from number forty within the first year and got it into the top ten. The second year into the top five. Wally Phillips didn't like me because he got a twelve point three and I got a twelve point four Arbitron. Mm. 
and Roy Leonard never liked me. <laughs> <laughs> but I always liked well, Wally and I got one. We used to do the Channel 11 auction together. Do you remember the Channel 11 auction? Sure. Mm-hmm. They don't do it anymore. They just do not do it. I remember Marty Robinson. Marty, sure. One of the one of the real stalwarts of, yeah. of the old Channel Eleven. Yeah, he just kind of disappeared, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I saw him about a year and a half ago. We because no, uh, I I participated in a, a couple of PBS documentaries. One called uh, "City at War Chicago" and one before that, which was "Heroes on Deck: World War II in Lake Michigan." And at the screening of it down at the Siskel Center, uh, I was had. Uh, it was fortunate that I I actually sat with. Marty Robinson and his son. Oh, <laughs> they were sitting right at the same table. I'm like, wait a minute, I know you. I've watched you since I was like a fetus. This is incredible. I can't believe that you're actually here. And he sounds <coughs> just the same. Well, Moves a little slower, but he sounds just the same. He, he, he couldn't believe that he was there himself. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, As you say, he just sort of disappeared. There was no grand announcement right. that he's that retiring retired. after a no. storied career. He well, just was gone. Just in gone. radio, in what they call terrestrial radio, AM and FM, uh, People on the air, you you hear about them, all of a sudden they're gone. They disappear, right? You never hear what happens to them. Well, these days, too, a lot of the talent, quote-unquote, is perishable. Mm -hmm. That they're burning brightly one minute, and they just fade away into this this blizzard of history. Uh, A lot of the the notable names that that, uh, we grew up with, the Franklin McCormicks and H.V. Kaltenborn and Ed Murrow and and, uh, the others that are very notable that actually started, and believe it or not, Tommy Bartlett, we're all familiar with Tommy Bartlett, he started on WBBM. He actually came down from Milwaukee. And he got an announcer's job on WBBM, and he was there for about three weeks. And Tommy he already Bartlett? Came, Tommy Bartlett, well, yes. He, 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 came, he came to WBBM when the station was seven years old, so he came in 1930, and he was 17. He actually came down from Milwaukee. And mm-hmm. he started here, and then he went away. He, he was on until World War II, <coughs> off and on. And at, at WBBM, mm-hmm. the announcer, you did everything. Basically, so you were doing station breaks, you were introducing a popular music show, you were going out and doing a man in the street interview, um, and things became your duties became more numerous you're also as the time engineer. went along. You're also the engineer, you're everything. You're chief cook and bottle washer. When you go out on a remote, you know, you got to maybe, if you're lucky, a sound guy out in the sound wagon with a disc lathe out there mm-hmm. cutting the acetate discs. And then they were then they would put those on later. So yeah, Tommy Bartlett, um, he mm-hmm. and um, Cliff uh, Johnson, um, he uh, had a show where in the 1940s, right after World War II, um, they actually had eight microphones set up in his family home because he went into H. Leslie Atlas, who was the head of WBBM. He was a general manager, vice president. After the station became an O and O, I mean, he founded the station, basically from a spark station in 1911. He and his brother Ralph Atlas, they grew up in Lincoln, Illinois, uh, out by Bloomington. Do you want uh, to explain for our listeners what an O and O is? An O and O, an owned and operated station, <laughs> basically, and eventually a wholly owned subsidiary of a larger uh, network like CBS, ABC. You know, the you're alphabet be like Real Radio NBC. Theater of the Mind. You put your own words <laughs> to it. That's it. Yeah, just imagine <laughs> this is what it is. Night. Like the WBBM <laughs> Air Theater, people would hear that, and <coughs> they would think there's a theater. Mm-hmm. You know, basically, you had a 200-seat auditorium first over at the, uh, the Wrigley Building, uh, back starting in the 1930s. Uh, after that, in 1956, they moved to uh, McClure Court. Uh, in 2006, it moved to Prudential too, for an, it's a, as an all news format. But uh, but rewinding the clock, if you will, and going back, H. Uh, Leslie Atlas and Ralph, he, uh, they were two brothers, and uh, they had a little spark station which just broadcast Morse code back in 1911. And when World War One broke out, um, Leslie went uh, overseas, and he was with an artillery unit as a signal officer. And he learned even more about radio. So when he came back uh, in the early 1920s, 1923, he had a little 200-watt station with his brother in the basement over at 110 Park Place in in Lincoln, and the house is still there. (laughs) And uh, so they were broadcasting out of the basement. In 1924, they were granted the letters, uh, call sign WBBM. That was just random. And so it was one of those, we're going to talk about uh, coming up here, a little foreshadowing about what's to come, about how call letters, what they mean, that uh, a lot of the, the notable call letters in the city of Chicago and elsewhere 
uh, around the country, they actually stand for mm-hmm. something. They were actually customized sure. calls. If I could just interject a little bit, sure uh, I didn't know about, about WBBM's call letters before. Yes. We broadcast better music. We broadcast better music uh, in the 1920s when he moved up to Chicago and, and moved the studio uh, out of the basement uh, uh, at um, 7241, I believe, on uh, Sheridan Road, right at Sheridan Road and Jarvis. That house is still there, too, by the way. <coughs> that was the, oh. the Leslie uh, Atlas household. Um, they moved to the Broadmoor Hotel over on Howard Street, and so it became mm. We Broadcast Broadmoor Music. Interesting. Uh, we had world's best broadcast medium. There's all sorts of things that that uh, uh, WLS. WLS, world's largest store. Right. Sears WGN, Robux. the world's greatest, greatest newspaper. The Tribune. Chicago Tribune. Yeah. How about WMAQ? Anybody have like a? Well, that I, I didn't pick up on. No. That was owned by the Chicago Daily News, and so it was. We must ask questions. Whoa! We now must how did you, how did you find all this out, Chris? Yes. Uh, You've well, been I'm cheating. Booking. You've been doing some looking. I'm bookish and have no friends. See, I spend a lot of time in the bathroom. Can you tell when you've got a couple broadcasters? <laughs> I know when he's pulling the okie doke. That's it. <laughs> and, and I'm sure there are many people that believe that radio, if they know anything about radio, <laughs> assume that it began sometime in the 1930s and don't realize that radio goes back to the early 1920s. Oh, yes. And of course you had, as you say, you know, the wireless goes back to the First World War. The well, Mar- Marconi and I invented radio. Right, absolutely. <laughs> so you were, you were, uh, I was you, you, were like, you were like Watson was with, with uh, Alexander Graham. Graham Bell. Come, exactly. come here, Watson. Exactly. Yeah, he's so good he spilled acid <laughs> on himself. I think we had yes. network radio yeah, by a, the middle well, 20s. Well, KDKA yeah. was the first one in 1920, mm-hmm. and so that's your first commercial radio station. It wasn't until uh, 1921 that KYW erupted here in, in the Chicago area. And then, then all, almost, in order to kind of get all of the dates right, yes, I've been looking that stuff up because it's, it's just a blizzard of things because you have stations that shared uh, time. They kind of coexisted, uh, smaller stations and larger stations that were on the same uh, frequency assignment. Like originally, WBBM was at 770 kilohertz, not 780. It wasn't until World hmm. War II that they got shifted over to 780, and then they were sharing uh, that particular uh frequency assignment with a station out in ironically enough lincoln but nebraska so at night they had to coexist and they eventually when they became part of the same network they wound up synchronizing their 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 broadcast so one you'd hear the content of the other and it was identical so it's it's okay we can just do it and then uh, further on a couple more years later they just dumped it all together what, Most, I, what does wkyw mean wkyw oh what does it mean <laughs> <laughs> I'm, turn I'm afraid, I'm afraid to answer that yeah. question. A lot of a yeah. lot of times, if you get a well, like WXLC is across Lake County. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of times, when you get to uh, a station and you just can't figure it out, chances are it's probably the uh, initials of the license holder. You know, people people initials. don't realize also that W. The call letters W are all east of the Mississippi. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. West mm-hmm. are K, but except K A okay. in Philadelphia, yeah. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because those are the legacy stations. And so that's yeah. the first yeah. station that did a remote broadcast. And they did right. the, the W and the K, the ham radio, too. Yeah. But now they get kind of get they got so many of them, they kind of getting away from The 1924 mm-hmm. conventions were the first political conventions to be broadcast over the radio, and the mm-hmm. Democratic nomination that year was deadlocked it went to over 100 ballots and for days and days people would hear the beginning of every roll call was alabama (laughs) casts 48 votes for oscar w underwood (laughs) and people learned the name of this oscar (laughs) w underwood because that alabama was leading off the roll call and they kept hearing this and they were saying it was going to kill radio because here they're they're going to give them the excitement of of <laughs> the conventions and they're just deadlocked ballot after ballot after ballot and they can't come to radio the radio's doing that to themselves today <laughs> well you know what's really ironic about election results is that uh the first actual broadcast of wbbm where it was actually still about 200 watts before it got boosted to a thousand it was actually um back before the station call letter assignment was was actually granted and in full effect to him. And H. Leslie Atlas actually went on his 200 watt station, and he broadcast election results for like the Lincoln Bloomington area. And the way he got around that 
because those little spark stations are supposed to be only doing code and that's supposed to be doing voice transmission. You want to explain when you say a it's spark station? Spark sta- it's like a dot dot. Di- ham radio. Yeah, it's a ham radio. It's a, it's a ham so radio so station. People, people yeah, listening yeah. will know what, it's what the just reference a spark. is. It's like kind of a nickname for it because it's you know sparks and whatnot. Right. It makes noise. Anyway, uh, they were supposed to you know when he could finally figure out how to transmit voice, he really wasn't licensed to transmit voice but he did because he was technically taking and broadcasting to one other station so he had uh, initially established contact with one other station so and he was sending the voice to them he couldn't help <laughs> it if somebody else accidentally overheard and so that's how H. Leslie Atlas really got into things very early on he realized the power of radio the power to entertain and inform and he was they called him Mr. Live Showmanship because that's what it was. It was as live as humanly possible unless there was a transcription that had to be done. You know, if we have to go a uh, man in the street and, and record it and, and bring it back in and then play it that way, that it couldn't physically be done live, that they would have to actually send it out. And the original, the transmitter bounced around from their house in Lincoln to when they moved up here to Chicago because it was originally... Um, you're talking about WBBM again? WBBM, right. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of stuck on Well, you're kind of stuck on BBM, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I have this uh-huh. weird affinity for uh-huh. Is there a reason why, why that one particular station seems to consume a great deal of your interest? Well, uh, not not only by virtue no, no of imagination. me being... <laughs> yeah, no imagination whatsoever. Yeah. I, I'm very cloistered I mean, I that way. I'm going to say some things like that, that, Yeah, worry. but, there, you know, <laughs> not only by virtue of my affiliation with the station, but you know what this really came from? Is that on my birthday... <laughs> Uh, this year, July 18th, 2019, the main broadcast antenna was brought down at uh, Itasca because they moved the transmitter over to Glendale Heights. It wasn't over on Route 53 there? It was right there off of the old Route right 53 or Rawling Road and Devon. Mm-hmm. It was a 57-acre tract right there that was actually acquired in the 1930s. Um, and not used until the 1940s, really, at the outbreak of World War II. Uh, because the uh, the transmitter, when they increased, they they kept upping from a thousand to two thousand to five thousand to ten thousand to twenty five thousand to ultimately fifty thousand watts uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, BBM moved their transmitter out in the mid 30s from the Broadmoor Hotel out to what would be the Glenview Naval Air Station. It was out at the Curtis Reynolds Airfield out at Lake and Shermer, and they had two 305 foot towers. Uh, originally until 1939 when they erected a single uh, vertical radiating stick uh, it was th- uh, 490 feet and they went up to 50,000 watts. It was a big year in 1939 and after a couple of months of testing this single element tower they went live with it and about a month later it collapsed in a sleet storm <laughs> that went well so they went back to their their backup transmitter antenna and they re-erected another uh, Blau Knox antenna, 490 foot, and uh, when World War II broke out, the airfield was taken over. Curtis Reynolds was taken over. Curtis Wright, uh, you can use that interchangeably. Curtis Wright Field was taken over by the uh, Navy Department, and it became Glenview Naval Air Station. So now that big antenna is in the way, and that's when they moved out to Itasca, and they they constructed Mm -hmm. it in 1942. They took about six months, and they built it. Here's, a, qu- here's a question. Okay. How many of you actually listen to radio today? I do. I do. I do. In the car. Do you? Do. What's, okay, do. what station? Usually WGN. I had WLS on and WBB and WBBM. <laughs> that makes one. 890. 890? Yeah, that's WLS? WLS. Hmm. 890, 560. Okay. Chris, we know what station you listen to. 79 point, or 77.9. It's, it's an old-time Okay, well, WLS got the Arbitron here. I listen. Okay. I listen to the, the morning news on WBBM every morning. So do every I. Morning. Every every radio that I own. I like CBS. The, the every radio that I owned, here in my bedroom, mm-hmm. in the kitchen on top of the refrigerator, in my car, and the two radios up in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, are. In fact, I woke up this morning to WBBM at six o'clock this morning, and. Fortunately, I heard a very familiar voice given the traffic report. <laughs> we won't mention his name. Could, could you tell us who the, yeah. was anyone we might know? Would would the would anyone recognize the name? Of the I first think his, his first name, his initials begin with a C. 
C. Okay. Yeah. Chester? But, yeah. Now, what but, are, but the only radio station I really enjoy listening to is WBBM. Not because Chris is here, but I enjoy listening to it. You know what's really fascinating is that as I was growing up, because uh, I was actually born in Tulsa in 1964, then we moved to Phoenix, then we moved to Tucson, then we moved up to Chicago, and I lived right down the street from Schurz High School oh on, uh, on Milwaukee Avenue between... Uh, Addison and Pulaski. So I got the Milford Ballroom on one side. I got Scherz High School in St. Vitor over there. I got the really cool billiard hall that I used to go down and look in the window there. And uh, there was always action. That was the out. That's it. And and I would always walk to my grandmother's house past Smoky Hollow. And it was a bar. It was always warm and it always smelled really good out there. I always wanted to go in there. And my dad's like, eh, it's not a good idea when you're like five. (laughs) So (laughs) there'll be plenty of time for that. But my mother, uh, from the very first moment that they changed from what they called middle of the road or kind of a news talk format which they did during the um, first part of the 60s uh, about three quarters from about 1960 to 68 when they changed over Mm -hmm. to all news before then it was mainly music it was like 95 percent music well you remember you said the milford ballroom how many of you remember milford i do you remember and and also also gentlemen years ago WBBM. In fact, I even have somewhere in my in my collection of tapes here. WBBM broadcast live dance music from the Oregon Ballroom. Yes, they did. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, the and so did WGN. Yeah. But the Milford Ballroom, they had their last broadcast back in the eighties. Mm-hmm. And I was the one that did it. Oh, you yeah. did. Oh, I wow. closed the Milford Ballroom. Is that right? Yeah. I so. Go ahead. No, go on. I wanted to ask you a question because we've made some references to it, and I know you said you were with WJJD, and you pointed out that it was a fifty thousand watt station. Fifty thousand watt. Could you? What is what? What is meant when a station reaches that threshold of fifty thousand watts? I mean, what is the range? Well, if you want any more power, you got to move to Mexico. What is the range of a fifty? How you know? How is, can you be? Can you well, hear it throughout can you, the United you States? Guys, you guys all remember Eddie Hubbard? Oh, right. sure. I just Eddie, want to talk about him. I hired Eddie, and he was working the seven or the three to seven shift, and we lowered the power at four thirty. Well, Eddie that night forgot to lower the power, <laughs> and we were fifty thousand watts. I'll tell you how far fifty thousand watts gets. The next morning, I come in and I'm checking my tape. Turn your <laughs> station down. Turn your so and so. This is so so in Utah, <laughs> Salt Lake City, Utah. We can't use our station. <laughs> they were on 1160 frequency, and we were blowing them out. Blowing mm-hmm. them out. Mm-hmm. So, will a 50,000 watt station in Chicago? Can you hear that in Los Angeles? Can you hear it in not New York anymore. City? Not anymore. You used to be able. To, you used to hear it in Vegas when it was right. a clear channel. So it's yes, not the whole that. United States, but pretty close to it. Yeah. Pretty. Close what was that clear channel? That clear channel. Nobody else was on that frequency. Because I remember getting Chicago from. The central Florida areas, but at night, not through the day. Yeah. Like when Franklin McCormick was on, it was a clear channel. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and probably he would get an atmospheric skip too. Sometimes it'll yeah. bounce off the. Yeah, it was a, it was a good good tight signal. Especially in the winter time when you have ice on the on the ground, the the signals would bounce off the ice and would 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 would, uh, would <laughs> keep tra- <laughs> keep traveling. And okay. talking about Eddie Hubbard, Eddie Hubbard is is uh, well at at that years ago he was part of our family because my cousin married uh, uh in into the uh, and i met eddie Hub- hubbard many 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 times eddie and, and i've shared a couple of cocktails the other one night and <laughs> forgot where we were and and, <laughs> and i used to go where you should have been and i used to go up to i used to go up to chatek wisconsin which is up near eau claire or past past eau claire and i used to sit on the, on the porch up there with a little portable radio and i used to listen to wgn and music from the aragon borough oh yeah well, what about the, the bloopers in broadcasting? Yeah. How many, well, how many bloopers have you heard? Well, I know the, f- the famous one with Harry Von Zell where he said, Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Hubert Heaver. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, there the were, Duke there were and the Duchess ones. became the Duck and the Duchess of Windsor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On a Jack Benny show, they talked about Drear Poussin. <laughs> well, being a young announcer in the early days, I had never heard the word internment. Hmm. Never heard the word internment. I was just back out of the service back in the 60s. And so at little radio stations, when you were paying your dues to work your way up, I gave myself 10 years to make major market. And I made it nine years, 320-something days. <laughs> <laughs> made major market from New York to L.A. to Chicago. And uh, so I'm reading the obits, and I come to this word. Oh, okay. Henry Jones, 
services will be held at the South. The entertainment will be held at the Southwood Cemetery. Entertainment. <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> I never heard the end of it. <laughs> no, that's internment, not entertainment. There was an announcer who once once converted a high White House source into a high white horse souse. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that one. Well, well, I did uh, not uh, only d doing radio, I did television weather for a few years. And uh, I'm doing the weather one night, and I'm talking about a cold front coming through. And I said, has this cold front come through tonight? Our temperatures are going to fall. And when I said that, the map fell off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. I, just, well, I didn't know what to do. My wife was at home listening, and uh, watching rather, and she said, you look like you're going to cry. I said, well, I didn't know what to do. I just sat down on the set, and I looked at the camera, and I said, you know, our temperatures are going to be falling tonight, but not quite that fast. We'll be right back. <laughs> what you know, do you do? WBBM News Time is on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be spontaneous. You know, you know gentlemen, you you were talking about WJJD. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> My name is John Joseph DeVito. Ah. So I used I used to go around and tell everybody that my uncle owned WJJG because I was John Joseph DeVito. That's, that's what it is. That's my, my name. So I used to tell everybody that my uncle owned WJJD. Well, everybody believed me, but one guy one day came up to me and says, you know, you're a real smart ass, aren't you? I says, why is that? He says, your uncle doesn't own WJJD. Plow Incorporated owns WJ. And I tell oh, he really, he really knocked me down. Now, Chris. You should have said, but my uncle owns Plow Incorporated. <laughs> yeah, one up him. It's like, oh, by the way. outstanding in his field. Now, Chris. Yeah, Dr. Scholes. Chris, huh? you, you said that uh, that the WBBM uh, tower that used to be out on uh, Route 53 just uh, south of WGN's tower has been has been. Uh, removed is that right yeah it was removed uh it actually they they cut one of the three guy wires uh about eleven forty-five in the morning we had to standing out there in the pouring rain with all of the uh, other senior technicians and engineers that had been out there that had manned that station over the years um two uh, three days later or three days earlier than that the uh, 250 foot freestanding tower which was the first one that was there which yeah. was original yes um to 1942 that one was basically taken down by a sawzall blade uh, -huh. uh and knocked over was pulled over by a track hoe um the other one uh basically we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and it took the itasca pd had closed down uh devon and it closed down raw wing and mm -hmm. we're waiting for mm -hmm. it to go down just in case something went wrong and it turns out because it was raining so hard the guys with their uh their cutting torch it kept going out in the rain <laughs> so they're out there swearing at the top of their lungs trying to get the, this big bridge strand to cut <laughs> and uh, sure enough, as soon as that one guy wire let loose, the other two brought it down right where they they said it was going to come. My eye, my eye doctor is right across the street from uh, from from where the tower is, or from where the old tower used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there and uh, now, where's the where's the new antenna now? The, the new antenna is actually the old antenna. It's the score antenna, the main stick uh, out on uh, Army Trail Road at, by Bloomingdale. You right want to give them the, the definition of stick? Oh, it's, uh, it's an antenna, slang for an antenna. Oh. When we're flying the helicopter, <laughs> we call it the widow maker because oh. it was thinner in cross-section all the other antennas <laughs> you couldn't see it okay well wmaq was right there also on yes on that the was trail. the old kyw then it became wmaq and now it's the wscr uh transmitter building so okay, it's, it's a okay so now is wbbm's new tower in that area it, it's it's riding piggyback on the other tower there so we've actually come down during the day uh, we're 42,000 watts as opposed to 50, and then the night is like 35,000. It's the uh, opposite way around. It's, it's 35 during the day and 42 at night. And what I just want to signal. establish is that in 2019, <coughs> if you want to broadcast radio, you still need a tall antenna just as you did 100 years ago. Is sure, that correct? Sure, mm -hmm. and, and for TV, you put them up on top of the Sears building right. or, the, or right. the Hancock Center. I knew that every time I went by with the And you never want to go up on top of the Sears Tower either with an engineer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was there ever a time in early radio when most of the uh, antenna or transmitters were just on tops of tall buildings? Sure, on before top of them. Before they went to the rural locations, which... Right, right. We're in the Broadmoor Hotel in 1925. They had the transmitter was there on the roof of the hotel, and the studio was actually a little cordoned off area in the corner of the lobby. For I, WBBM. I can remember when WBBM television would run. When I was a kid, they would mm. run this little icon, if you want to call it, or, or, or still frame on TV with the American National Bank building. 
and that was where their tower was. And they, they showed this little profile of a building I'd never, I'd heard of the Prudential Building and sure. the Tribune Tower. But it showed this picture of this building, mm. and it said broadcasting from the American National Bank building. Yep. I have no idea. If the building get probably still there, but I don't know where it is. Right. Yeah. Excuse uh, me, John. I think John is telling us. Keep going. Now. Oh, going. Keep going. Forget okay. The so we're, we're not going to be taking uh, s station what breaks. Okay. Another one of the interesting aspects of the, the BBM transmitters, number one, the, uh, their senior engineer, current senior engineer, Doug Campbell, uh, I was... Uh, We've gone from doing the helicopter for traffic to driving mobile 780 for the time being. It, you know, the the whole business is cyclical. You get the bills and the bean counters get a hold of it, and the attorneys and say, "Well, if you're up in the helicopter and you crater the thing, it's bad PR." I was like, "You're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be first on the scene, though. I don't want to be the scene." Yeah, if you have anything to say. <laughs> yeah. So basically, we're we're doing the car with mobile 780 right now, and we were keeping it out at the Itasca transmitter site while they were doing all the work over in Glendale Heights couple of interesting factoids here about some of the antennas that we're talking about. If you go past the Glendale Heights uh, antenna, and you will see the big, long, tall antenna, which is over 600 feet tall, there's a smaller 250-foot freestanding antenna that has kind of a big sweep. It kind of looks like the Eiffel Tower in cross-section. That's an original Marconi Tower that came from New York. That was part of the New York's World's Fair when they were basically uh, promoting Marconi and had been sitting in the in the bushes for a long time until it was brought out here to Chicago in the 1920s been up ever since so that actually dates back to the early 20s wow. that would be technically the oldest antenna that's in use here in and Chicago it is in use right. it's not it's just there as it, a, as that a that is the, in the, a, the shorter use. antennas those are always your aux your auxiliary uh, your backup unit so if you're doing maintenance on the big stick you got to turn the thing down uh, got to turn it off. It's got to go cold because otherwise you don't want to be wandering around in there because the, the, the you know more wattage in the cottage, fifty thousand watts will kind of cook you. That's well, not good. They locate out there <laughs> largely because of high ground or lack of other buildings uh, for both. Both basically everything when that that was put out there in the nineteen twenties, there was nothing out mm -hmm. there. The the original photographs show nothing at okay. all. Maybe a, a, a rundown fence row and farmland. And farmland. Right. It was all farmland. Yeah. And it, it was higher in elevation, too. And all of these buildings, um, well, let's talk about BBM while I have it on the brain here. That uh, <laughs> What else do you have? That's it. It's BBM or BBM, BBM or bust. BBM, BBM, we build right. better mousetraps. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, out there in Itasca, <laughs> we, uh, uh, I, I was able to... The paintings are alive and well. That's it. Uh, I was able oh, to yeah. actually go into the transmitter building because hey. Don said, hey, you want to take a look at this thing before we go ahead and shut it down. And that's where my real interest, uh, current interest, uh, was revived in, in radio history. And when did you get in radio? What was that? What year did you get in radio? Uh, 30 years ago. So um, it would, hmm. yeah, it would have been... Well, you so were only 12? 88 or <laughs> I was only 12. <laughs> Well. It, it was it was in actually the early '90s, so a little bit less than 30 years. Anybody yeah. here remember Clark Weber? Oh yeah, oh, sure. Clark Weber from Milwaukee. Clark yeah. was working at WIND. Mm -hmm. Remember IND? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was at JJD, and we both. I was assigned to do a broadcast from the Cadillac dealership downtown. Clark was assigned to do a broadcast for IND at the same Cadillac dealership. It wasn't Emil Denemark. You we said weren't supposed to both be doing the same broadcast, <laughs> but we showed up and we did it. And only three people came in. I mean, that shows you how many people listen to us. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know. they wanted to buy a car. But <laughs> to tell you how important the ratings are, mm. at the end of the broadcast, Clark was packing up his stuff. I was packing up my stuff to go back to 180 North Michigan. And uh, I walked over to Clark, and I said, Clark, I said, I just want you to know one thing. He said, what's that? I said, two of those people were mine. <laughs> <laughs> I win. <laughs> I am very good Wait. friends with, with Clark Weber. Good, you're telling that uh, story. You'll say, don't I want to hear it again. Yeah, he had a Cessna yeah. 310. He flew back and forth all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, John, is he still doing well? I met him about five okay, years ago. Okay, he, he, he lived in Wilmette. Okay. And Bob Roberts from WBBM used to deliver the newspapers to Clark Weber when he was a, a, a newspaper boy. And... Uh, now he, uh, he, after he got out of broadcasting, he moved to a condo downtown, and just recently, maybe within the last year or so, his wife passed away. Right. And, uh, but Clark Weber, after he retired from, from radio, and Wally Phillips, after he retired from WGN, 
there was a gentleman out in Crystal Lake called Jim Hooker. Mm -hmm. And Jim Hooker bought the rights to WAIT and changed it from AM uh, 820 to AM 850. I wired up the studios out there in Crystal Lake, right behind c uh, the, the college out there. And what Jim Hooker did, he took Wally Phillips out of retirement and brought him to WAIT on Saturday mornings from 9 to 12. He took Clark Weber out of retirement and brought him to WAIT on Fridays from 7 until 9. Well, because from the studios on Route 14 and 176 in Crystal Lake to Wilmette, out on those, uh, just between Wilmette and Evanston and uh, out in that area, there was no easy way for Clark to get there to the studios. So what we did, we set up remote broadcasting for Clark Weber. And I was in Clark Weber's home in his office in his pajamas, setting up, setting up, <laughs> setting up the remote broadcast, the microphones, the computer, and the whole nine yards. I've been out at Clark Weber's house three or four times, to, you know, uh, to, to to hook up the equipment for for so he can broadcast uh, back to WAIT in the studios. A couple of times I would call in while he was on the air. Oh, you're the WAIT electrician, so that's how Clark Weber knows me as the Clark as the, the WAIT. Uh, uh, electrician. But yes, uh, like I was telling you before, Chris, about Bob Roberts, he uh, uh, he, he was out there and, and the one Monday when I was coming home from Wisconsin, uh, he was on the air and, and giving out a, a big fire out there in that area, out there in Glemco, I think it was. And when he came and he sat here, I said, oh, I heard you on, just like I told you today, that when you came in, I heard, I heard you at 6 o'clock this morning, 80 miles away from here up in Wisconsin. <laughs> But but uh, um, radio broadcasting, gentlemen, is in my heart. If you were to take a teeter totter and put radio broadcasting here and, and fire department here, it would be equal because mm -hmm. I, I love mm -hmm. I love both. John, I, this I is radio. Them. This is radio. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> we. <laughs> so, um, but yes, and then I'm so happy to meet Chris. To meet this gentleman here, and he's been my my dear friend for a couple of years. And you said your birthday's in in July. July eighteenth. So I'm a moody Cancerian. And you know my birthday is July sixteenth. Sixteenth. All right. My my father's birthday was July eleventh too. He was the used to be the president of the Antique Airplane Association. We used to put on the DuPage yeah. County Air Show back in the late sixties and in through the mid seventies right. there. So, uh, but. Um, one last thing about uh, going into the transmitter over there. When they decommissioned the transmitter building, I was the one who pulled the, the call letters off of the transmitter building and um, pulled all the last equipment out of the racks, hmm. uh, took all the tuning coils out of uh, the Don't the, tell the, the engineers you knew you did that. No, 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 no. <laughs> they were there. They actually <laughs> said, this is actually an abandoned site now. We've hmm. declared this. We, we don't want it anymore. We've actually turned it over to the, the builder developer. So went down in the basement, and there was uh, a Murphy bed down there that the engineers used to sleep on when they were monitoring the old well, air cool transmitter. <laughs> well, good. You I've can come on over and take a look air. at it. <laughs> and so, so, I got, so I got the the Murphy bed, and I actually went and, and took uh, uh, representative parts off of both of the WGN six. WGN has one also there. down in their, the bottom of their transmitter. Da, down in the war room? Down, down in there? the war room, yeah. <laughs> Just in yeah. case. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, out there in case of, you know, d nuclear blast. Uh, right, exactly. You're, you're ready to get back on the air with all today's news, sports, weather, traffic, everything's there. A, f a funny thing no about, a real quick thing about Clark Weber. I had him on our program. I do another program called Now and Then Talk Radio, which is heard all over. And Clark was a guest with us. And he said, well, when I die, I said, oh, Clark, don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. He said, well, when I die, he said, I want them to play one thing. I said, what's that? He said, the old W. I, I, first off, I said, well, what do you mean when you die? He said, well, I want to live to be 89. Hmm. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, that way when I die, they can play the old WLS jingle. <laughs> <laughs> At his funeral. <laughs> well, he uh, had published so a uh, pretty interesting uh, photo book of 1970s era radio, mm -hmm. Dark Weber. And uh, another name like that, very big on Chicago radio, who kind of ended his career out in the suburbs, the one and only Howard Miller. Howard Miller. Oh, yeah. Howard. Oh, yeah. There was a guy. Howard he offered me a job once. Did I, he said, tell I, said, I said, how much? He said, 900 I said, oh, a, a week. 
He said, no, a month. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Howard, it's well done. And I said, come on. He, he owned a station in Geneva. Yeah. yeah. And that was later Us on, kids, though. there was a guy by the name of Dick <laughs> Biondi. Oh, yeah. Got thro- oh, yeah. Somebody said he got thrown off the air, but I don't know about that. Who? Yes, he uh, did. Biondi. Yes, he did. He did. Dick yeah, Biondi did get thrown off the air. Yes. The, sto- the story is, is that he made a comment about when miniskirts were just becoming popular. Mm. He said, this allegedly... He said, if they get any shorter, girls are going to have to start carrying two cones. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, that supposed dun, 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 dun. That supposed oh, that was, was a baseball game. Yeah. Five-yard penalty that's on that's that it. That's yeah. a good one. I'm hearing those loser horns from The Price yeah, is Right in my uh, ear here. <laughs> we we, we began. You were oh. telling us about WJJD when back when it was number 40 out of 39 stations in mm-hmm. the Chicago area. And how you shifted the uh, the format from music. I wonder if you, if you oh, had the truck drivers didn't like me. If you had any, had anything more to say about that, we we got away from that, and I wanted to know what the, the sort of the <laughs> finale of that. Story well, it was, was just it took a lot of work. We took uh, a couple of weeks changing the format. We opened up uh, the first day with Frank Sinatra singing Chicago, and the rest of the country and western stuff was gone. No more country and western, and it's a. Uh, it just went on and on and on, and then finally the station was sold to Infinity. Mm-hmm. Infinity thought they knew more than what we were already doing, and they changed the format. What did they change it to? It was kind of a light rock and stuff like that. And then Infinity ended up selling the station because they went out of business. When you the the first day that you ch- when you had Frank Sinatra were you deluged with well, calls? We got calls. We got calls. Yeah, we got yeah. calls. Yeah. I would get in between thirty and forty thousand letters a year from listeners. Now, not to mention calls. Do you gentlemen know where the where their transmitter was? WJJD's where their transmitter sure. was. Yeah, I know where it is. On, on, <laughs> Bell, on Bellard Road, right yeah. off of the uh, uh, the tollway that goes up to Great 294, America. Two ninety four. It's on the left. There's three yeah. tower, four towers. Yeah, four mm-hmm. towers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's where the station was broadcasting from originally. We finally got the station to broadcast after a year's work with the FCC. We got a full-time license, 50,000 watts a day, 10,000 night. And we moved the station to 180 North Michigan. Right. And that's where we broadcast from. Mm-hmm. We went out of the old transmitter. I mean, I've worked at radio stations so bad that if somebody flushed the toilet, they'd go off the air. <laughs> they would lose their grounding <laughs> in the early days. Well, you know, yep. there's, so, there's so many people that pass through Chicago radio, not only the, the personalities, the on-air personalities, but the people that were discovered here, um, you know, over at that station that I keep talking about at BBM. <laughs> um, uh, H. Leslie Atlas had a, a visit um, by Will Rogers. He came through. Yeah. It was They were good friends. And he came through. He says, you know, there's this guy. He's out west. He's a telegrapher in a railroad station, and this this kid can really sing. You may want to give him a listen to. He, his name's Autry, and so he <laughs> sent a letter out to Gene Autry and had him come. He's put him on the air and discovered Gene Autry, and they were fast friends after that. And he, about two weeks after Gene got on the air and started singing in Chicago, um, he said, "I got word that he called him into his office, and if you got called in the." The, the boss's office if something was going haywire because otherwise he'd just let you roll with it if it was good and he said you know I'm, I'm getting word that you're taking singing lessons <laughs> if you continue to do this you're fired I don't want you to take singing lessons and become a singer I want you to be Gene Autry and he was and people that he gave air play to Patty Page uh, the Andrews sisters um, there were a lot of people here in Chicago. The, how about the, the original Doublemint twins? Because they were mm-hmm. at the Wrigley Building. They were sponsored by Wrigley. The Boyd twins, uh, actually Jane and Joan Boyd. Jane uh, Boyd married Al Schwartz, who was the producer of the American Music Awards, and he produced the Golden Globes. And strangely enough, Al Schwartz was also the stage manager at BBM TV for the uh, Nixon-Kennedy debate in 1960. And literally, when I first went over to BBM TV, when I started over there, they showed the the main hallway. They drove the limousines right into that hallway, and literally they got out and went right into Studio One where where BBM TV had been doing their news broadcasts from. But well, that's where you do commercials. That's that's live commercials. That, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Now Everything was when live. When you say the yeah, Andrews yeah. sisters uh, and, and Patty Page, were they live? I mean, they were, they they were live. They, they, they were. were, they were, they were not recordings. Yeah, they everybody were in the studio went through, and then eventually live. there were but recordings. But they they came through here because he would prefer to have it live. 
Now, stations with the stature of WBBM, uh, like uh, KCBS, WCBS, WCCO, WCAU in Philadelphia, uh, KMOX down in uh, St. Louis, they each had uh, a studio orchestra, basically. In yeah. Chicago, they had 50 uh, players here. They had uh, four arrangers. They had three transcriptionists that would copy the music because when the music came out and it was arranged and it would go off, to the different people that you know right for the strings right for the, the horn section blah 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 because they they literally were on standby when they became part of the CBS network they were the musical interlude if something went haywire they'd get a call real quick from New York start playing or the light would go on and they they know oh we got to start playing a and lot they would play until the light went on a lot of people didn't realize that the Andrews sisters lived in Chicago that's mm -hmm. right at the mm -hmm. New Lawrence Hotel yeah, yeah. right and, and the Boyd sisters were actually they were they were twins and they were from Hammond, Indiana. Uh, the Norzer sisters, I think Norzer is their last uh, uh, last name, and they sang under the name of Boyd because that was their mother's maiden name. Hmm. And so, um, yeah, they they were the original Doubleman twins. The second mm -hmm. oh, the second most original Doubleman twins actually lived in Palatine. The, the well, longest yeah. surviving, I guess you could say. I remember asking Maxine Andrews, I had her on the radio with me. She was sitting in the studio, and I said, Maxine, will you marry me? <laughs> and she kind of looks at me like she didn't know what to say. And she looked at my hand, she said, oh, hon, you're already married. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, Chris, you had a mention in, in the, at the beginning of this that uh, about uh, um, uh, Tommy Bartlett. Tommy Bartlett, yeah, yes. Okay, well, Tommy Bartlett had a quite a, uh, a big... Uh, show up into Wisconsin Dells. Oh, yes. Oh, Everybody yes. Knows about yeah. that. Yeah. That, yeah. That's yeah. how I remembered until yeah. I found okay. out that Tommy Bartlett came ashore at WBBN. That's yeah. where he started. Okay. He was an entertainer. Now, every month of July, <laughs> Tommy Bartlett would have Franklin McCormick come up and broadcast the all night mm. show mm. on, on uh, right, right from the right, right, right there from the Up Hops restaurant. And on on Friday afternoon, when I got off of work, because I worked for Illinois Bell, I get off of work. I get pick up my at that time was my fiance Barbara. We get in the car, drive up to our summer home in Elkhorn, have supper with my mom and dad, go right down County Eight to the to the tollway, and go right up to the Wisconsin Dells. And I sat right next to Franklin McCormick the whole time he was on the air. Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday night. Then you must remember Lenny Eagle. Yes. Yes. Okay. And and uh, and then at the uh, and back in the 1960 something or another, when the Aragon Ballroom closed its doors to the to the to the music of the big band era, I was with Franklin McCormick, Cliff Mercer, and Wayne King. Wow. Link. Yeah. Wow. Link. Yep. Yep. This this what great hand, memories. This hand shook Wayne King, Cliff Mercer, and Franklin McCormick. Uh, and now I'll tell you another little story about Franklin McCormick, if uh, if you don't mind. Mm. Sure. As you, as you gentlemen all know, I'm involved with the Chicago Fire Department. My father-in-law was a lieutenant on Engine Company 56 over at 2214 Berry Avenue in Chicago, right near Riverview Park. This one particular day, he was detailed to the firehouse behind Wrigley Field, which is Engine Company 78, and they have an ambulance in there, Ambulance 6. So when I went to 56, the guy says, go over to 78, the lieutenant wants you to go over there. So I went over there, and I parked, and he went in, and he introduced me to everybody. We're just going to sit down to eat. Hello, Ambulance 6. You have an inhalator call, WGN 2501 Bradley Place. So the fireman says to me, come on, John, jump in the ambulance, take a ride with us. So we get in, I get in the ambulance, we get down to, down to the studios. Frank Pisani was standing by the door, you know, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. So we, we got the stretcher, we got the inhalator, we walked into, and he, he took us to the studios, and who's laying on the floor? Mm. Franklin McCormick. And I helped take Franklin McCormick out of the studios at WG at 2501 Bradley Place. I was listening John, to was this uh, in the middle 70s, roughly, when yes, Franklin died? Mm, yes, no, no, no. yes. Yeah, 72. That'll yeah, 72, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. And, I, and I was there, and I, I helped put Frank McCormick in the ambulance. Dead. Oh. Well, it's amazing how radio can bring people together uh, much, much, uh, at a much different level and a much more intimate level, even than, like, the Internet these days. I mean, the Internet is so invasive, and it's so there, and it's so in your face, and it's so right now, and you can right. see people in their, in their worst nightmares. At least with the radio, you have a little <laughs> bit of standoff distance. 
because it's right. in your mind now. It's in your mind's eye. Um, theater of the mind. Theater of the mind. One, of the, right. yeah. one of the great lines that I, I have always liked was someone once said that when they were talking about the television and how television took over drama from radio, he said the thing, that, thing is that, that actually radio dramas were better because the pictures were better. They sure. are. <laughs> exactly. They're much yeah. better. It, it's something that kids don't have today. It's called imagination. Well, the great right. thing that yeah, right. uh, about try and trying to get those things on the air, the stories that come in over at the Wrigley building, they had the Wrigley bar that mm -hmm. everybody kind of, the, the announcers, when they weren't announcing, they were in a saucer of whatever. No, no, you no, know, no, they're, no, yeah, no. Yes, yeah, Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there was one in particular who was so go nameless who was enjoying a saucer, and they, they basically, um, <laughs> he would do, he had a really good timepiece and at the bottom of the hour when they were going to be meet meeting the, the network break he had to go do a real quick station ID back and time. so it would get down it was back time to about 20 <laughs> seconds and he knew it would take him 15 seconds to get down the hallway <laughs> and make the turn and it would take another five to just do the stage break well finally you know word gets around and the engineering staff <laughs> put the microphone at the top of a 15 foot ladder <laughs> <laughs> so that when he got into the studio, here's his 15 foot ladder. The microphone was not at floor level, and so he goes racing out there. And he's, he fell back down, went back right to his saucer again. H. B. Coltonborn got locked into the actual uh, men's room over there because he would, was in Chicago, and you know he would go to whatever. Oh no, he would go ahead and mm -hmm. he would do his reports from there. They would just throw the paper in front of him and he'd read it. <laughs> well, he got locked in the Wrigley build. The the knob came off of the of the bathroom, and he couldn't get out. So here's H. V. Caltonborn. We're like a minute and a half he to air, and the engineer he's calling for him in a very authoritative voice. And he ran down the hallway and got as much cable as he could, and he threw the microphone and the script inside there, and he did the report from the, the now, men's washroom. What network was H. V. Caltonborn with? Do you, do you know? No, he, he was actually, he was one of the CBS guys. CBS. Yes, hmm. yes. I like so the way Truman mimicked him. Yeah. Oh, the yes. the right, yeah, so, so and the president yeah, is ahead <laughs> in the <laughs> popular vote, but there, we there, have yet uh, to hear from the farm states. There are a lot of guys that were like that, <laughs> believe it or not. Paul Gibson had a had a show on uh, WBBM, the uh, Housewives Protective Union, and he was always, I cannot stand these women. They remind me of cows. <laughs> and it, it's like, but the women lived lived for listening to his station. They flocked to it. They bought all the products that were on there. It was absolutely amazing. My dad always talked about another broadcaster of that era, Gabriel Heater. Gabriel Heater. I, think, and he, I think my dad said his tagline was, oh, there's good news tonight. Good. There's good but news. But he'd always get around to the bad night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's not exactly <coughs> black. Gabriel so, uh, Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, mm. in the 20s, in the late 20s, uh, I think it was the University of Iowa had decided that people didn't talk funny from the Midwest. So mm. Illinois, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Iowa is where there was a, an original crop of broadcasters that came from. They were announcers. They, didn't, they weren't affected by any kind of a regional dialect of any, any type. And Midwestern announcers, and are Midwestern hired announcers, more over yes, across the country. It sounds like Bill Curtis. Yes, yeah. yes, that there, it was absolutely there was no afflection. Mm -hmm. You could not tell he was from any reason. How y'all doing? No, it was nothing <laughs> like that. It was very square. You know, well, it was very prior, well. Prior very well to spoken. that, I think the East Coast kind of ruled the roost. Yes, and they had a kind of an East Coast. Yeah, they, on the East Coast they say water. Right, it's water. a glass of water, right. not water. water. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> Tommy Bartlett and Jim Conway and Cliff uh, Johnson were the, the last three of those 17 that were living up until the early 90s, basically. You mentioned Wayne King. Wayne King. That was the first orchestra they did a remote with. Now that's going back. Wow. The Waltz King mm -hmm. out of Savannah, <laughs> Illinois. I got the call to do the remote from Fairyland Ballroom in DeWitt, Iowa, on a little radio station in the middle of nowhere. And so I get over there, and Mr. King, how you, you know, I sound like I was doing a helicopter report. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was so nervous. And finally, okay, all ready. And he starts with the, his theme song, The Ball She Saved for Me. And I did the open, and then did the announcing. It was only a 15 minute show. Went to the engineer at the back of the ballroom at the end of it. I said, How'd it go? He said, We never got on. <laughs> I said, Oh, don't tell Mr. King that. He'll kill me. <laughs> You know, they never got on the air. 
they lost their telephone line. Oh. Oops. Mm. Which was a balanced loop. You know, you guys are talking about all of these people and that. Uh, when I got old enough to be able to drink, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we all sounded better, by the way. On the Five year. years yeah. old? I, <laughs> I uh, ended up at the Sherman Hotel as a house stick with my dad and uh, another guy. And uh, the Showman's Club was just a half a block away. And all of these people that you're talking about came over to the Sherman Hotel. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, they came over there. They Well, <coughs> they like to uh, throw the dice down on the floor, which we would let them do. Have you, have you ever listened to a radio show where they allowed you to drink? Mm. Uh, I bet no, you not. Did they ever so. have one on yeah. TV? I did, did one on a New Year's Eve show. Mm-hmm. There was a doctor there. We're showing the effects of alcohol. <laughs> and so they said, well, you're the crazy one, Farrell. Why don't you do it? Said, okay. So it would be a shot and a beer every 15, 20 minutes. By the time I read the 5 o'clock news in the morning, first off, I started to do the countdown at midnight. And I started, 10, 9, 8, Two. 7, 8. Nine. <laughs> I started going the wrong direction. Fourteen. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the other, the other <laughs> then I got to do the news at five in the morning, and Brezhnev was a Soviet party leader at that time. The story came out, the Soviet Peter leader is visiting town <laughs> instead of the party leader. <laughs> so if there's ever a blooper, I can be in the middle of this. Anything that can go wrong. The, yes. I didn't realize it at that time, but uh, those guys were crazy, and, and uh, a lot of them were a lot of fun. And well, right. We have fun. Guy, well, some guy called, he said, that's the best radio program I ever listened to. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so one, one of the stories you always hear about is how somebody in the studio would set fire to a script yes. while the man mm-hmm. was reading I was reading literally just going to talk about <laughs> that. Yeah, <laughs> so it would so literally so come maybe up you can talk, talk about that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. yeah no, and I, they, I had somebody type me a script at a little station in Indiana I was working at. I really worked around. <laughs> and... The, the the copy read, a body was found north of Fort Wayne in a ditch. Stabbed 17 times, shot 22 times. <laughs> Police suspect foul play. <laughs> 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 I'm thinking, what the heck? What did they just give me? <laughs> After you got to it. Those are my news days are over. <laughs> I'm not a newsman. You know, John. Uh, I was going to mention, uh, back in the spring, I had the uh, pleasure of meeting an old-time personality, John Drummond. Oh, yeah. Bulldog. Yes. What a Bulldog Drummond. Oh, yeah. Yes. He was doing a presentation at Mather, oh, and sorry. we enjoyed it immensely. He's blessed with the memory that as if things would happen just yesterday. And, of course, he could comment uh, on today's headlines. <laughs> oh, uh, you know. The clown? Yeah. <laughs> John yeah. Drummond. What a... Well, what a gentleman. What was interesting about John Drummond, too, is when I started over at CBS uh, uh, TV, I wanted the first thing I wanted to talk to, the per- first person, I don't care. Bill Curtis, yeah, well, okay, that's good. That's it. That, you well, go Walter. stand over there. Well, uh, Walter <laughs> is like, where's Walter? Let's just watch where he's Here he is, step. right here. Yeah, just watch where he's step. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to Bulldog Drummond because my dad, when I was growing up here, my dad owned a burglar and fire alarm company. We put in the alarm system for all the mob guys. And so I knew mm. all of these guys because I was a kid. I was invited into their houses because I needed to get up in the ceiling to run the wires and stuff. So it's like Nono's DeFranzo and Alan Dorfman and Irv Weiner and the <laughs> Spilatro brothers. And, you know, we went out to Vegas and did the alarm system for Tony out there, did Mike's here in Oak Lawn or Oak Park, um, did and the clown and everybody else and the tuna and his daughter who lived in Inverness. And all, I'm just listing off all these people. You know, Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, Frank Nitty's kid who had the travel agency, who wrote the ticket for us to go out to Tony's place, and all the different <laughs> haunts, you know, whether it's Chicago Picks or Pegasus a Flying Horse or, um, you know, the leather bottle where everybody would gather if they needed an alibi. <laughs> I knew all this stuff. The, the meat block where uh, at the south end of, uh, um, and we're getting off subject a little bit, but it's in the news too. It's on the radio. Um, South End Old Town, uh, the Meat Block Restaurant, because Frankie the German Schweiss, he lived back there above the kitchen, a very well-used kitchen that only had a really well-oiled meat block and nothing else in it. Well, that's a different story. But anyway, and he's the only person that ever I was scared of because he decked my dad. He actually punched my dad out. (laughs) But anyway, so I wanted to see the Bulldog because I... 
was in all these guys' houses. And, and so I went over. It's like I, I, I went to the studio because I, I walked right past his office. Everybody else had these big, glorious offices over there. And his was what should have been the copy room below the stairway right outside the studio. So he was the closest physically to the studio. And you walk in there, and I hear this tap, 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 because he's pounding away on an old, like, royal typewriter or something. It's a manual typewriter. Everybody else is doing word processors and stuff. And I walk in there, and he's got his, like, bookie jacket. You know, it's got the, it's got the, the, it's got the white and black checks and stuff. And he's got a, an unlit stogie in his mouth, and he's got other, all these other tipperillos jammed in his, his shirt pocket where the seams are ripping. He's like, I'll be with you in a minute, kid. You know, he's like, tap, 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 tap. And I walked over, and I'm like, oh, hey, okay. I walked over to all these filing cabinets. He had row after row of filing cabinets. He had all these cards sticking out of them. He had all these video tapes, and he had notes, liner notes and stuff, because he needed to pull this stuff and get it over to uh, the, the production facility. So it would play while he was doing his, his, his shtick. And I'm like, oh, here's Joey the Clown. Here's Nono's de France. Oh, here's this and that and the other. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is uh, over here. Did you know that uh, uh, Hoagie's Pub was a safe house here in town? Did you know that right behind it was uh, John Fosco and his brother and Mama Fosco lived across the street from uh, um, um, the uh, Johnny Marolo who owned the Club Algiers over in, in and I'm, I'm going to and Giancana and this and that and that. I'm just naming these people off <laughs> rapid fire. He's look and you hear the 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 typewriter starts to slow down. He's like, what? <laughs> he looked over at me. We were fast friends ever since. Because I, I told him about stuff that he didn't know, and he told me about stuff that I didn't know, and, and you know, I was just a kid, so I was innocent. I wasn't listening to any business part of this whole deal, but just by virtual I wonder if the mob ever there. tried to get to Bulldog John. I'm sure. I, I, Terrible okay. publicity, I'm well, sure. I'm one would think that somebody would have tried yeah. something at yep. one time. If nothing <laughs> else, morning. being intimidated, okay. you know, no. you'd the not... The morning would come in dummy up yeah <coughs> and, and that's why all he was here right sure got it you know you first mentioned, thing you know you won't know nothing you mentioned yep. giancana yep. you know <laughs> being a retired police officer i'm not going to mention this guy's name you know who i'm talking about uh he was assigned to organized crime and at the time they were followed they used to put a tail on all these guys all the names that you mentioned yeah. but didn't he, he have family in the police department uh giancana? yeah yeah he did he a couple did. officers yeah, and uh and so this guy again who shall remain nameless uh he was sitting on Giancana, and he came home about 4 o'clock in the morning, and his wife said to him, where the hell have you been? He goes, what do you mean, where have I been? I've been sitting on Giancana. You know, that's, you know, that's my guy. i got to <laughs> watch him. Well, so, well you, better, yeah, you better call the office. Well, why? He's dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well. He goes, what? what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got shot and killed oh, while he was yeah. supposed to be sitting outside. Oops. Oh, I bet you I didn't know who he was, too. Yeah. That's it. Did you ever come into a radio station? That you, well, you never had to sign on a radio station, did you? Right, no. Uh-uh. A little radio station, again, in the middle of nowhere, had to sign it on at 5 in the morning. Uh. Mm-hmm. So the lights are all out. This is down in Virginia now. To walk in, no, that's all dark. And I'm trying to find the key, open the door, and I'm walking along, and I tripped and I fell. And so... I'm leaning back like this, and I'm, I thought, oh, I had. <laughs> it was the general manager, the owner of the radio station, which are very cheap at times, and they want to do their own engineering, was working on the transmitter. Oh. Mm-hmm. And it got electrocuted. Oh, good That's why all the lights in the whole block were gone. Oh, well, that, well there's your problem right there. <laughs> this is before cell phones. <laughs> here's, what, here's what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in the tuning shacks at the base of the antennas, they have very distinct uh, directions <laughs> that you do not go past a certain right, you line. Can, you'll glow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And you'd find dead mice, you'd find dead snakes because they would come in through a lot of the cable channels, that could, the, the cable tunnels that ran from the main transmitter building out to the stick. And so they'd get in there and get, yeah. get cooked. Doing an all-night jazz show, yeah. which I did for a long time. Mm. Um, Three o'clock in the morning, I thought, well, I guess I'm just going to close my eyes a little bit because I've got a seven-minute cut. I can play it and I'll just close my eyes and relax. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> I woke up at 4.30. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh. The record is going like this. Click, oh, click, God. click, click. And the worst thing about it, no one was calling. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is our Welcome nice progressive radio. jazz moment. 
<laughs> it's like, wow, it's got a great beat. I guess you could dance to it. Oh, it's not man. much on backfill, but it's like, <laughs> on, on, out like a light. On w- <laughs> J- misty for me. On WJJG, we had a, a, a pastor, Pastor Johnny Dodd. Just, just, he was a very, very nice gentleman. He was black. And um, he would come in on Saturday mornings to do his show from seven, uh, from uh, well, from sign on, because we were, uh, you know, we had a certain time we could have to sign on, a certain time we had to <coughs> sign up. Well, I'm up in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, and I got the radio on uh, on my refrigerator. Six o'clock, I don't hear, I don't hear no signal. <laughs> Six ten, no signal. So a couple minutes later. My cell phone's ringing. <laughs> Hello, John? Yeah, th- this is Pastor Dodd. I can't get the station on the air. As I realized that. Well, we had a deal where we could, I could take and dial into the transmitter, turn the transmitter on or off b- o- over the phone. Mm. So I says, Pastor, I says, uh, I'll call you right back. So I dial up the number, push number one, nothing. I could hear I could hear the transmitter. I could hear the click, but the the the, the signal was not the, the 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 we weren't we weren't on the air. I'm back and forth. So I said, "Well, Pastor, I said I'm going to have to I'm going to have to drive 80 miles, or is even further because our transmitter is off of uh, it's in it's in Elgin off of uh, the uh, Eisenhower Expressway." So I get dressed. I drive all the way in. And I'm checking this and checking that and doing this and doing that. And I can't figure out what the heck the problem is. So our chief engineer, uh, his name was uh, 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 Kaplan. I call him. I says, uh, you know, I can't get the station on the air. Well, try the out to and see if that's okay. So I'm back and forth and back and forth. Uh, he says, well, go, to the stu- go back to the studio, which is about five miles away. And he says, go down and see if you hear the audio down in, in, the, in the telephone box. So I took my headset. Yes, I can hear, this, I can hear the, the studio on, on, on the phone wires. I went back, to the, back to, the stu- to the transmitter site, and I'm mucking and mucking and mucking and mucking. What happened? I happened to bump the, the, the uh, interface box between the telephone company and our equipment. I bumped it, and when I did that, there was a mouse that got inside <laughs> inside that <laughs> box. He ate all the coating off the wires, and he went with with him walking around in there. He shorted the wires out, and that's why the, 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 we went up on the air. When I hit the box, I must have separated. I must have jarred something. All of a sudden, boom! We're up back on on the air. In the meantime, the truck I had had a bad oil problem. And between Elkhorn, Wisconsin, and, and, and there, I blew my motor. <laughs> so I had, a, I had to get a tow truck to, to pull the truck out of the transmitter site, and then I had to call my, my business partner. He had to come and pick me up and let me use his car. So, and then, then another time I was out there uh, doing some work, and I didn't realize that the stick is energized. AM, that whole thing, and I grabbed the hold of it. Well, let me tell you not. My eyeballs open up like right now. You're still smoking. <laughs> yeah, for that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I tell you, some of the experience that I've had we, radio broadcasting. We used to change light bulbs for a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you go up and ground. Oh, you're the only person when yeah. you do it, and so I ground myself and change the bulbs. Yep. But I'm the uh, first one to do a hot air a, a radio show from a hot air balloon. <laughs> yeah. A, a hot air balloon. We were over a mile high, and a Piper Cub flies by in the way. But I thought it was like a dream. But we were doing it on a, a military type of transmitter, which you shouldn't have, but it was going to the AM station. And so the pilot from Barrington says, let's go down and take a look at the cows. I said, okay. So we're descending, coming down. We're about maybe 50 feet above the ground going along. And we got caught in the wind shear. And the envelope of the balloon went down to the ground and slammed the basket, and then we just drug the last thing you heard me on the radio saying, son of a... <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be right back after this. <laughs> and the guy, the guy on the air thought he was going to be clever. This crash brought to you by Canada. <laughs> <laughs> they canceled their advertising. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. hey, this, is, this is something real. Uh, well, it happened yesterday. Uh, I turned on the uh, Bears game. I'm sorry. <laughs> so am I. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, I didn't uh, see the rest of it. But uh, it's all in Spanish. Oh. It's 
it's all in Spanish. Nos Musica Valaces. Except for the advertisements, and they were in English, and I'm calling my son-in-law, I'm calling the kids, <laughs> and what the hell do I do? I said, there's got to be something. What? But it's BBN. Spanish. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I got uh, uh, Xfinity. I went from AT&T to Xfinity. Well, I finally got through to Xfinity, and the guy said, uh, on your remote, do you see where it says A, B, C, D? Yeah, it says push D. Push D. <laughs> it was English? It was back to English again. Back to English. Yeah. Were we any Never better? Never heard of that. <laughs> Never <laughs> heard of anything. You you know, that's been happening to me, too. Well, you, you would have been we, better off keeping it on the Spanish. Okay. Yeah. 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 We lost yeah. in Spanish yeah. and English. A yeah. lot of these little radio stations sell to different people who want to come on Saturday or Sunday morning. Please. Yeah. And there was this one uh, priest or minister or something, I don't know what he was, and I had to be there at the station to play the tape because it was a ten, ten and a half inch reel. And so I thought, well, seven and a half. I played it seven and a half. It was a foreign language. I get a call about five minutes into it. What are you doing? I'm playing the show. Well, it was recorded at three and three quarters. Oops. But it sounded foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded completely foreign. It sounded Spanish to me. <laughs> they talk fast. Oh, There's those Spanish I hamsters get, uh, you've yeah, got I, going there. I couldn't That's get a interesting. Handle on it. It? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book, and it, when it comes out, it's called Secrets from a Silent Microphone. And it's going to be something. We mentioned the Bears. There was a time when Jack Brickhouse and oh. Irv Cupsonet were the celebrated announcers yeah. for the, the Bears games. I wondered if you, either of you had any interesting stories about either Jack Brickhouse or Irv Cupsonet. Well, I remember Cupsonet. Jack uh, talking one time. He didn't know his mic was on. <laughs> and he had some real words, mm. you know. Yeah, he had some good ones, and it came on. And Brickhouse, when he was with Harry Carey, Harry Carey actually had a few. Imagine that. And he was actually yeah. driving. And they were late getting over to Wrigley Field, and Brickhouse was scared for his life. He sees signs going by. They're driving on the sidewalk. Hang on, we're getting there. <laughs> and they, they came rumbling up, and his, there he's Big Lincoln. He came screech, screeching to a stop on the sidewalk amid everybody. It's like, hey, hey, guys, how are you doing? It's like, we're late. Get out of the way. One thing you learn in radio is to watch what they call the phone pot. Right? Mm -hmm. So you don't put yes. the phone call on the air. Yeah. Well, I'm driving home, and I'm listening to... JMK, which was our FM, Magic 104, in Chicago here. And I'm listening to the PD, I won't mention his name, but he's talking to some woman and he's putting the hit on her. He didn't realize he was on the air. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's amazing things that will just kind of sneak up on you. Oh, like when now. I got home, I called him. He was still talking. <laughs> Nobody was listening to the air monitor. Oops. And he was trying to make a date. Oh I said, God. I said, so-and-so, your, your, your conversation is being transmitted. Do either of you have any celebrity stories? Any stories about well-known broadcasters or well-known people who were involved in Chicago broadcasting mm -hmm. in one way or another? Any anything you'd care to share with us, or you know, something that that might be of interest? Cliff Mercer, when he left WGN, I tried getting a hold of him for a long time uh, because I wanted to have him come over and talk to me at WJJD because I had, he was a good announcer, you know, and uh, he. Uh, wouldn't return my calls or anything, and finally one day I called him and he answered. I said, Cliff, I said, I've been trying to get a hold of you. What's wrong with you? Nothing, nothing's wrong with me. I said, I want to talk to you. I don't want to have anything to do with radio. Ooh. I said, Cliff, I said, come on down. I said, we're 180 North Michigan. I said, I would just take a couple minutes. I want to talk to you. No. Uh, okay, I'll come down. I don't want to do radio. So he came down, and we're sitting in the studio, and you know, you have a main mic and you have a guest mic, basically. Not like this. And, uh, I st I'm looking at a commercial for First National Bank of Chicago. I said, look at the crap they write today. Not, th not First National Bank, not cr I don't mean it to sound like that, but the copy was terrible. I said, Cliff, look at this. So he's looking at the copy, and he just told me, that I don't want anything to do with radio. And so we were taking a break. I said, you're listening to WJJD. We'll be right back after this important word. And I pointed to Cliff, and he gave me a look. Boy, if looks could have killed, I'd been dead. And his mic went hot. And he started to read. And you remember Cliff Mercer? His voice, very smooth. Then it all just <coughs> broke down into butter. It was nice and smooth and, and warm. And he got done reading, and he looked at me and went back on the air, and I just stood up. I said, welcome back. I said, Eddie Hubbard's going to go over to the AIT. I said, I want you to do the afternoons for me. He said, you want to hire me? 
He said, you trust me? I said, of course I trust you. I said, we're 15 floors up. I said, if you screw up, you know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how Cliff got back on the radio again. Somebody put faith in him. Mm -hmm. Well, the great thing, you know, not too terribly long ago, a uh, year before this, last year, uh, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of WBBM and um, as a news radio. And so I walked into this room, and all of retirees had come back again. <laughs> and, and so I'm seeing people that I only heard about, you know, when they were coming out of the speaker <laughs> that my mother had turned on years ago. And people that I'd worked with, you know, Sherman Kaplan and his wife are there, and hmm. John Haltman, of course, that I grew up with. And, um, of course, Felicia and Pat Cassidy and uh, oh, yeah. John Cody, um, uh, Len Walter. Uh, Len Walter actually, you know, he, he spontaneously gave me a call from his house and complimented me on, on the things I've done on the air and spot news and things like that. And so to me, everybody was a celebrity because um, these are all the people I grew up with. These are the people that I knew growing up as a kid. You know, other kids are listening to rock music and country and western and um, <laughs> uh, other music genres but i was listening to news radio and here i was you know able to coexist with all my heroes around here um people i would have loved to have met the the calton borns and eric severide and mm -hmm. uh the murrow's boys uh bob height and bob trout and murrow of course um and i know that ed murrow you know looking back uh on his tenure with cbs um he believe that the radio medium should be used to inform but also teach and he was mortified when it morphed into infotainment where it was more about the entertainment value and here in the city of chicago you know we were the soap opera capital we had 30 or 40 soap operas out of here and you had uh, other shows that originated that started here, like Amos and Andy and Fibber McGee and Molly, Jim and Marion Jordan, that actually came from Peoria and worked here in Chicago. Uh, that that uh, they actually started out as a vaudeville act, and then they had different different iterations of themselves. Um, and uh, to to listen to the radio shows and to to grow up listening to this. Th these fantastic stories and laughing with people and the Jack Benny program, you know, uh, Waukegan's favorite son. Um, these people that came from around here that were just so magnificently talented. And right. to be able to, when that, that antenna came down, um, you know, all of it was one of those where it had been there since uh, that particular antenna, the main one, was date back to 1946. A lot of ghosts. Right. Yes, and, and the mere fact uh, that when I went on site afterwards, because I had befriended everybody from Premier and Bridge, the, the two coexisting corporations that are developing that site, I was able to take uh, and remove parts of the antenna, um, and that all of the, the, the voices and the memories and the things that, that came off of that, that radiated out of there, including my own voice, that meant a lot to me. Well. I've got a question that, that, that occurred to me because you mentioned some of these well-known names and I remember some of them. Mm -hmm. Your voice really doesn't age. I mean, you can continue broadcasting uh, sure. on, into, on into whatever age. Okay. Do many of these, these well-known names, do they retire because they wanted to retire or do they retire because the station or the network decides it's time for them to go and replace hmm. them with somebody Mainly else? Mainly the older, the, the, the especially in news radio, it's their own choice. It is choice. Right, because they, they as long as they're able to read copy right. mm -hmm. and as long as they're able to get it out on the air, without forgetting things or forgetting <laughs> losing their place course, or reading course. the same thing course, over and over yeah. again. If there's something that's not medical in nature... As long uh, as you keep your marbles. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes, so as long as you've got it together. So people who are doing a good job, and, and they are not generally forced out by some station director that says it's time for a younger... I, in the news business, no. Uh, it, it, it's not... Uh, 
because your voice, they want somebody who is accurate, timely, stately, right. who can be trusted. Forward motion. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Uh, right. Uh, it, it's not so personality driven as you would have your top 40 or any other kind of novelty station. It used to be. That, yes. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Very when, much so. Well, yeah, yeah I guess you were disc a jockeys. That's a, dif- that's a, a different Yeah, people would tune in to right. hear the guy on the air, yeah, and yeah. the music was a bonus. Yeah. Right. 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 The guy on the air was, the, it was personality driven. Right. Yeah. It was mm-hmm. is their shtick, what they're doing, right. you know, how do they look because they're going to be making. Uh, yeah, D- Dick Dick Biondi. Oh yeah, Dick. Example, mm-hmm. example of that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Long staying. Oh, Dick, yeah, Dick right. Biondi is yeah. like a poor poster. Yeah, like you said, right. if you're listening, yeah, I'm just like saying that said, to you, I mean, Dick. The music was like secondary to his personality. And yeah. you're talking well, about old t- old time radio shows. There's only one place, and that's on Saturday afternoon. They have old time radio, and, oh, yeah. and it's not meant to be a. Uh, plug for them because I don't really remember their their call signs but uh, it's a station out of um, out of uh, DuPage uh, College yes yeah, College of DuPage yeah okay. yeah yeah, yeah. 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 WDCB, I would think. Yeah, that's it. Yes, it is, Chris. Yes. He might not admit. I used to do his commercials for him. Right. At Metro Golden Memories. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, he used to be right on Addison. The Mighty Metro Art Players. Right. Where they would have their, they would recreate things. Yes. Now, you're talking about Chuck Shaden? Chuck Shaden. Okay, Chuck Shaden grew up a block away from where you're sitting right now. Right in the 4200 block of Ottawa is where... Chuck Shaden grew okay, up. Okay, very good. Oh, yeah, that's great. And he went, he went wow. to uh, Giles School, which is the next block, block over. Mm-hmm. And he's been down here several times, too. And I never thought about it. Of course, he lives in Morton Grove now. I should have uh, invited him, but I never gave, gave it a thought until you just mentioned his name. There's Chuck a lot more Shaden. history to go, so mm-hmm. we yes, can yes. do it again. Yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. Well, uh, the, the, the one of the other things about the, you know, I was talking about the antenna and all the voices coming out of it and everything. I was the last person, you know, the representative for the station that was actually out of that building before it was demolished. And um, there's uh, the the history means so much to me. I walked around inside that building and I, I put my hands on all the equipment. And I said, thank you for all the service and all the memories and all the fun um, and the building itself. Because you can, you could just, there was no power to the building anymore. Um, the original uh, 50,000 watt generator was still in there because it was the building was actually built around it back in 1942. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, and to sit there and and close your eyes and just hear the echoes of all the people that had been in there before was just magnificent. And when the when the the stick came down, um, I found out that it wasn't the original one. The original one that went up in 1942 was only 490 feet tall. This one was 680 probably 682 I think it was 682 and the reason that it went up in 1946 is because of the war material shortage when it went up they took the original tower that they had over from Glenview and they erected it over there and they wanted because they were 50,000 watts they wanted to uh, increase the radiated output They, they wanted to get their their signal out further and they were denied because of uh, the lack of steel and so this is a solid steel tower. I should have brought one of the cross sections with me. It's only about this long because it was actually u- uh, hyd- a uh, hydraulic yep. shears. Did you, did you magnetize it? Above it? Oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah it's okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's it, and it's heavy. I mean, it is really heavy. Yep. It was a just amazing piece of <laughs> stuff. It wasn't that tower uh, knocked down by one storm or a, a storm at yeah. WBBM's uh, tower out there? The the one in Glenview was. Back in 1939. No, no, I was I was only a year old then. (laughs) 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 But there was there there was was, I'm not aware of it. There was a radio tower that that the wind blew it down. College of DuPage. Oh, that's the one. That's the one. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And it folded it completely over on itself. Yeah, that's right. Yes. WDCB. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's ninety point nine. Right. And Chuck, yeah. yeah, and and Chuck Shaden used to be there. Now it's another gentleman. Uh, I can't think of his name off the top Steve of my Darnall. head. Steve Darnall. Yeah, right. Chuck, Chuck yeah. Shaden's place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say that tower yeah, was six hundred and some odd feet? Yeah, <coughs> What flashes in my mind's eye is the uh, parachute towers at Riverview. They yeah. were oh. two hundred and fifty feet. I spent feet. all my money on that thing. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> sitting at the top. Yeah. Sitting at the top. Uh, little did I know, six months later, I'd be. At Fort Bragg, jumping off an airplane. Yeah, <laughs> hey, Fort Benny, yeah. Yeah, yeah 250 feet. I understand all those, those things at Riverview were all uh, privately owned, all the different 
You oh. know the one I really enjoyed? What? Hmm. Aladdin's Castle. Yeah. Oh, that was my Stand, favorite. Standing yeah. there. You didn't have and to go into the Now, wait a second. you got to stand there on the outside. You don't go oh, into the what, You stand there I mean. and you watch the ladies walk up on the full dress and the guy hits the air. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You don't even have to pay to go in there. Remember that? Yeah. When When television hit its stride in the late 40s, Radio continued to broadcast drama and comedy right. well into the 50s, into the late 50s. They were doing uh, Gunsmoke and Have right. Gun, Will Travel in the late 50s. What was it that caused that to finally come to an end? Was it ratings? Did somebody determine people that people just today don't in radio, anymore? other than news radio, because that's just strictly one format, okay? Strictly one format. Radio today thinks that everybody 22, 23 years old listens to the radio. And they're crazy because 22, 23 year olds don't even know what a radio is. <laughs> we're the last generation to grow up with radio. That's right. And we're the last ones to listen to it. You're not going to find a 25 year old listening to the radio. No, no, they're going to be no. podcasts and yeah. they're going to be they're, they're specialized radio entertainment. Station. So, yes. radio stations Narrow today casting. are niche. Uh, they're, they're trying to sell all these people, and now, because of it, the ratings are going down. Nobody's listening. That's right. You've killed your audience. Uh -huh. WGN did an excellent job of killing their audience when they thought that they could do that. Right. You know, and I've known the program. Let's appeal to a younger there. audience. They, they're going, wrong. That's not they're your wrong. audience. You know, it would be embarrassing back in the 1980s if somebody couldn't even get two points on the Arbitron rating. It would be very embarrassing. WGN was up among the top. JJD was among the top. Now, well, there's no JJD anymore. GN, I don't even know what they are. They're lucky to get three points. Hmm. I haven't listened to WGN in, I can't tell you how long. I can remember when, when I would listen to WGN. Well, when Wally was on and Roy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Roy yeah. And well, you, you, you know where a lot of people tell me, I, because I was the first one on the scene up there in Waukegan, or Zion, was when Bob Collins got killed. Well, That's right. Bob, right. They say when Uncle Bobby died, no. I just tuned out, because nobody could hold a candle to him. Uh, question. Bob Collins was, you know, a funny story, if you don't mind. Sure. A salesperson came into the studio and said, we've got to get this copy on the air right away. It's for Hassett Pharmacies on the south side. I'd never heard of Hassett Pharmacies. Have you? No. So I read the copy. i got got to get on. I couldn't even look at it. Coming up for break, 30 seconds, boom, I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. Hassett, ha. And I started off, I said, Hassett Pharmacies. <laughs> and I started, Hassett, Hassett, Hassett. And I sound like I went, went into vapor lock. <laughs> and now I'm laughing. i got tears in my eyes. The general manager of the radio station, I heard the back door open up, and he goes, You're going to end up in Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm driving home. Bob Collins goes on the air at 3 in the afternoon when I was off. Somebody gave him the same copy. He did the same thing. <laughs> How's it? And then he started, and he couldn't get out of it. So whoever wrote that copy, you know. It, well, it's amazing when stuff comes into you, or w like this will be, uh, this past year was the 26th year I've narrated the Air and Water Show on uh, WBBM, oh. and that's kind of the last vestige of what H. Leslie Atlas had envisioned, is that we would be live where something is happening, and outside of a, a like a football game or a baseball game, because we did the Cubs for one year out of what would have was supposed to be a seven-year deal, but we only did it for one year, one season, and um, when you're describing things, and you're doing it off the cuff, and you're doing it right now, um, you know, I, I don't want to be off color by by any stretch of the imagination, but I will leave it to your imagination. We had, um, and every year we do, we have one of the acts is called the Firebirds Extreme Team, and it's Rob Holland and Jack Knudsen. And Rob Holland flies a black MXS, which is a purpose-built 540 Lycoming uh, uh, airplane. Uh, it's a performance airplane. It's used for aerobatic demonstrations only. And Jack Knudsen flies a red extra 300 wally extra who designed the type it has a 540 lycoming single wing you know it's just basically a place for the pilot to sit to point the engine somewhere <laughs> because of the proving that anything can fly with enough thrust anyway so they will dive in for energy behind the audience and they will pull to the vertical and so as they're pulling to the vertical i've got rob on the left and jack is off to the right i put <laughs> is in is in there for this broadcast because I learned very quickly, Jack is off to the right, Jack is off to the left, now Jack is back off to the right, because I didn't use the word is in between there, and Joe Bartosh oh. looks over at me like, what did you say? <laughs> I'm like, oh. 
Well, let me rephrase that, everybody. This is a this is a a, a family oriented show, and everybody was just dying. People don't understand that. that. Yes, Eddie Hubbard. Yeah, I was reading a commercial. Of, what's that, Marine? Marine, the eye thing. I should know. I just Murine. Oh, Murine. Yeah, Murine. Murine. Yeah. Yeah. my right eye. Murine. Uh, Marine. Yeah, I'm doing a commercial, and Eddie Hubbard walks, and then the commercial starts out. Eyes tired. And I hear in the back room, Eddie Hubbard, you is? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, but lost it from that point on. That's it. Well, and if all stations now have a five or seven second delay, is that? Yes, oh, that's yes. only on talk. That's yes, callers that's calling in. Right. Oh, okay. yeah, we're, we're like yeah, one second standard. now. Because oh, okay. of HD okay. compression, we're one second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Usually it's, uh, yeah. You know, WG and had two, two, two terrible things that happened to them over their years. They had two uh, helicopters that came down. Leonard Baldy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And Earth Hayden. Earth Hayden. Yes. Leonard Baldy. Yeah, Leonard Baldy. Leonard and then Hayden. the other one yeah. was uh, 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 Bob, Bob Collins. And like I was just telling uh, Denny here, I... Uh, Two weeks before Bob got killed, he handed he gave me that hat. That's that's uh that's right 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 there. Oh really? Yeah. Wow, is that you, tremendous? You know who Look gave him that. the nickname Uncle Bobby? You no. know who gave him that nickname? No. Who? Cliff Mercer. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. When I got Cliff back on the radio, he gave me a nickname, and it was Papa. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bobby Collins, uh, Uncle Bobby would always hold court up at the Highland House, uh, the restaurant up in. Uh, Highland Park, Highland up on Park, Route 41. Yeah. He'd get there with all his motorcycle riding buddies, and everybody would all gather around there and everything. Yeah. And so, and that's the area Bobby, being where, he, where, he, where he went down, wasn't it, uh, Chris? No, he uh, was up in Zion. He was up in Zion, that's right. Yeah, 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 he was yeah. coming in mm-hmm. uh, from the northeast. Near a hospital or something? Straight in, he, into a hospital, yeah. Into a hospital. And uh, about a block away is where the girl that uh, he ran into, they mm-hmm. ran into each other, so it's a kind of a mutual aid yeah. thing because she was actually... <laughs> She was flying a Cessna, so it's a high wing, so you have little to no upward visibility up and up and over. And he was in the slin, so it has a shoulder-mounted wing, so down and forward is bad visibility. And he was on a straight in from the northeast. And the uh, girl, I think she was a flight attendant, and she had taken some flying lessons. She was solo, and she the tower asked her if she saw the incoming traffic and she kept saying no he's like okay well just stay with me i will call your downwind so in other words he will he will tell her when to call when to turn from downwind onto your base leg so she was on downwind and she turned base leg before he even said anything and she actually turned final underneath him so he was actually descending toward yeah, her and he came down the first, the only thing that they you know if you want to have any kind of speculation about did they see anything or feel anything is that the her vertical tail would have come up right next to the cockpit uh forward to the right the uh, starboard wing and mm-hmm. then that was it because he ate into her and she just went straight down and she fell on the street and they went across the street and spun down into the uh, top level of the, yeah. of the hospital and well, I, I got a call I've from the engineer, got, yeah. Yeah. Ed Woke. Mm-hmm. Did you know Ed? Yeah. Yeah, Ed was one of the main engineers. He called me, and he said, you never guess what just happened. And he told me the story that that happened. It hadn't even been made public yet. I said, oh, no, really. And I was downtown, and I was up for the traffic, the afternoon traffic. It says, you've got to get up to Waukegan and Zion. Like, right now, there's been a midair collision. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was passing Fort Sheridan that they said, you know, this, mm-hmm. this is Bob Collins from GN. But we're going to not say anything. Let GN announce it first on their air, right. then we can go with it. So this was about mm-hmm. 20 years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, gee, well, it was 2000, it was 2001, because it was right around the time when my yeah. father passed away. Yeah. Yeah. When Bob Collins? I think it was, was earlier. It, it was around the turn of the century. Okay. I think it was, I think it was yeah. wrong. I, I'm, it seems to me it was around 2000. I don't remember the exact year. Mm. Was it a homemade plane, or did he... No, it was a, that was a production plane. Is okay. Lynn is yeah. It's 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 a, a sport plane. It's a, a foreign make. I think it's. Are you a pilot? Backhand. Yes. You are. Yeah. Boy, did they make a mistake. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> it. They haven't got me yet. <laughs> with planes? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, with real life planes. Yeah. <laughs> While we're talking <laughs> about you know those big things, talking with wings, about things on them? aerial tragedies, and we're talking about Chicago broadcasting, perhaps the most famous live broadcast in the history of American radio. Involved a Chicago station, Herb Morrison, Herb Morrison which w, I believe was WLS, WLS yes. who was covering in 1937 so the landing of the dirigible Hindenburg yeah. at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Yeah. 
and gave the thing, oh, the humanities, this is the most yeah. terrible mm -hmm. catastrophe. And this, of course, was, was live, and it's something you hear on every documentary, anything dealing oh, with yeah. the 1930s right. or with yeah. airships. Anniversary. And, and, and it, was, uh, yeah. it was actually cut on a, an acetate disc while he was out there, um, but they were playing it back at the wrong speed. Actually, so well, he, so he sounded. He actually sounded different than. So he his voice doesn't that. sound like that. It doesn't sound as high. Oh, okay. ah. you, you, you need that to break down a little bit. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. didn't didn't they have a dirigible come down in Continental Illinois Bank? Um, 1919. On LaSalle Street. Jan, Jan, yeah. January of 1919. It was I just a few days before 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 my mother was born. She was born in January of 1919, and this happened in January of 1919. I didn't think it was that far back. An airship. An airship. Uh, mm. uh, that crashed downtown. That pretty much ended the yeah. idea of using, you know, the like. Uh, well, didn't they build a mooring somewhere in the city? Yes, yes. For for those. And I think I think that that uh, his broadcast probably has has a lot to do with with the the fact that the the, the the Hindenburg disaster is such a part of everyone's consciousness because very few there were only think thirty eight people died I think aboard the Hindenburg. I mean, it, 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 only, it only carried a hundred or so people, and 38 were killed. So when you compare it to the Titanic, where 1,500 yeah. people died, yeah. there's just no comparison to the... To, but it seems to be such a great catastrophe because everyone has heard that broadcast. And, and it, was, it was going on in real time live. as it's it was happening. happening. Live. The moral and you of can the story, don't right. take a cruise. Yeah. That, that, well, well, yeah. you can actually hear the the bursting of the of the explosions sure. in the background. It's muffled, but you can make then, it out. But yeah. I don't think the newsreel footage alone would have made it as as much a part of everybody's consciousness as that broad that radio. Well, people at the time they were used to using their their mind's eye. Right. And, and then just the opposite. I wonder how many people in the city would have has they even heard of the uh, the Eastland disaster. Oh, oh sure. And of course, but right. that's pre-radio. That's pre-everything. So there's, yeah. I mean, there's, there's nothing. There's what, no 1914? film. Nineteen fourteen. When was that? Four, 19 no, it was nineteen fifteen. Nineteen fifteen. So there's no yeah, radio. It's you know just before radio, and and uh, there were no cameras. So there's no t there's no there's no film. There's nothing. Right. So it's just something you read about. So right. it just doesn't have the impact. I think it's the single biggest disaster or loss of life in the city's history. Sure. Right. right. And and at least it happened. It it happened just r very uh, close to the sink of the Lusitania. Now, everybody's heard of the sink of Lusitania <laughs> because it's connected with the First World War. Right. And but this happened here in Chicago. But again, because there's just there's nothing visual. There's no there's no radio. There's nothing that you can uh, other than read about it. It doesn't have right. the same impact. With the Lusitania, from what I understand, there was a program on about it that it was sunk by a German submarine. True. And they had it was one of these programs that they drained the ocean. And it was down there, and they said it hit a mine. Mm. So it wasn't because of the. Oh, I think it was sunk by the Germans. It was sunk no, by yeah, a German. It was carrying it British. Uh, it was. It was material. carrying war. The, the controversy was right. that it was carrying war well, material they, for the they British. They showed pictures, yeah, and I don't know how just a accurate they were. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the German, you could the see German they said if, they if they a torpedo would have hit it, it would have different warnings in the New York newspapers warning people not to go aboard a mine. And this took off a big section of the side of it, but no, it was it was hit by a torpedo. It, right. was, it was sunk by a torpedo. But I mean, the controversy was that, of course, at the time the British denied that it was carrying war material. It was carrying war right. material, but it was wartime, and I mean, it, it, the British were fighting for their survival. You, you know, they were going to make use of whatever was was necessary to to bring war supplies to to Great Britain. Right. Rich, you mentioned uh, losses in the city. The Eastland, I think, it was 844. That sounds right. That oh, yeah. perished. And that was in yeah, 2015. Not quite a thousand. Yeah. 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 That was the single biggest disaster. And then the 274, 272 on the aircraft, and two on the ground with the uh, Flight 191, which is still the single oh. largest by just a couple of people aircraft disaster. Right. What year? Outside of, uh, May 25, 1979, right after, mm -hmm. right around three o'clock in the afternoon. Well, what was the Iroquois Theater? About 600. Yeah. That yeah. sounds right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that sounds right. Yes. yes. The no, interesting thing about is the uh, the Lusitania. I think there were about 1,100 who died aboard the Lusitania in 1915. So the losses from the east were very close. I mean, it's, it's right in the ballpark. Yes. The, the, the casualties with, with the when Lusitania. You, when you contrast the, the size of the two hulls, you know, the, the mere fact that the Eastland was just a fraction of the size of the Lusitania, right. that, that, that speaks volumes. And not only that, you know, the mere fact that the 
main channel of the Chicago River, the Chicago River itself was just a giant open cesspool. I mean, you, yeah, you, you, it was just all the sewage, all everything went in there. So even if you had survived, if you had gotten that water in you, you were yeah. pretty well doomed to a, a, a very brutal end. I'm from Cicero, and of course the the the, uh, the Eastland was carrying an excursion, mainly passengers' excursion from Western Electric, right. the great right. great AT&T complex uh, in in Cicero. And one of the great oh, stories Hawthorne about works. Hawthorne works. Hawthorne, Hawthorne works, works yeah. which, was, which you know, which was was there all through the 1970s. Was the the major employer in the in Cicero and several entire County families area. were wiped out. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen pictures. My my yeah. parish, St. Mary of Chenstohova, a Catholic parish. I mean, they they had multiple funerals. There were so many so many people that died that they were having funeral services with the nave of the church just lined with <coughs> with, with uh, caskets. But one of the interesting stories about the about the Eastland is that the the, the skipper of the boat. Mm. Was was trying to chase. They were, the, the, there were some. There were some wellers. There were cons, there were construction workers near the, the 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 Eastland, and they came with their torches and were cutting holes into the into the overturned hull of the boat to rescue the passengers. And he's trying to chase them off because he didn't want any holes mm. uh, cut into his boat. He was afraid they were going to damage the boat. Finally, the police came and arrested him. He was he was causing so much trouble. Right. I'm the captain. You're not allowed on this right. ship. And they finally they finally collared him and arrested him. And he was more concerned about the damage to the hull of the boat than rescuing people who were trapped well, it seems, yeah. inside well, of it. Didn't it's the an incredible story. Didn't the U.S. government buy the boat and was using it as a the training? The U.S.S. Yeah. 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 Was that the, the one that they, they changed into a submarine, uh, into an aircraft carrier? No, no. That was the Wolverine and the Sable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, those are the... This guy, this guy was a captain? He was, yeah, he was the captain of, of the Eastland. Yeah, and That's he, why in the service, and all of a sudden, he, he did not go down with the boat. Right. Yeah. He yeah. did not go down with the Well, there was another captain that was there in one of the, the <laughs> dockside warehouses, because at that time, LaSalle actually had a, a pass-through underneath. The, the road went actually right. underneath the Chicago River at LaSalle, and everything backed up to the river. It, it was not like it is today. And uh, there was somebody that was in one of the, the buildings there on the wharf, he was actually yelling down. He's like, because people were trying to get up on <coughs> on the deck, and the people that were on the or on the uh, hull, and people that had had escaped were slipping, trying to get onto right. the hull. Just he he called for the tugboat that was there to take the cinders out of the, the out of their uh, the firebox and throw them on the hull, and then take blankets and put it over the top of the cinders, and it would just glue and make them. Uh, you know, not like inside outside carpeting. So they went down the block to Marshall Fields. They got every available blanket that they possibly could, yeah. threw it on top of the, the cinders and ash, and actually allowed a lot of people to get out of the water that way. Okay. So, uh, you know, Chris, yeah. Chris, to your point, the condition of the water in the river. So I, in previous broadcasts, I've established that I'm a descendant of a survivor uh, of the Eastland. Uh -huh. My father was five years old, 1915. And he had passed away in 1949 at 39 years old. And uh, there was no doubt in my mind. And he was a businessman, and he was uh, a hard worker. Uh, but his health, uh, I think he paid a price being in that water. Sure. And uh, the condition, uh, the sewer-like conditions. You know. Yeah, the solution you, is uh, dilution. Do you know Jim, uh, Jim Cosgrove? Was, uh, I know the name, Bill. Uh, he was the president of the Sergeants Association. Okay. But his grandfather uh, was on the fire insurance patrol. They were the ones that were there first. The oh. fire department wasn't. Oh. And uh, they all got a badge from oh. some, I, I don't know, Cook County yeah. assessor, wh whatever it was. And they all got a badge. We have it at the museum. Uh, Jim uh, uh, gave it to us to put on display. Well, in my family's case, it, it was the Aiello family that uh, pulled my five my my dad when he was five years old. Uh, other family members had perished in in the oh. uh, catastrophe, but they pulled him out of the water and saved his life. They held him for two or three days, what with all the commotion yeah. and everything, and then he turned my father into the authorities. So whenever I run across anybody with the Aiello's name. I always tell them the story, and Famous sometimes they look at me yeah. very strangely, and all that. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite a quite a tragedy. I want to take a, a few minutes. Uh, we've we we've devoted most of our program today, and we're we're very grateful to the guests we've had with us. Uh, 
uh, talking about the history of Chicago broadcasting, Dennis Farrow and Chris Habermill from WBBM and WJJD, among other stations. And many others. And many Chicago. others over the years. <laughs> and we may, we may have some time as it goes, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about, since this is the Meet the Chicago Historians, an important uh, milestone in history that took place yesterday, October the 20th, 1944, 75 years ago yesterday, uh, marked the, uh, the the American landings at Leyte, the island of Leyte, in the Philippines. We often talk about the Philippines. The Philippines are divided into sort of three groups. There's the, the main island of Luzon in the north, which is where the capital, Manila, uh, is located. And then in the south, there's another large island called Mindanao, uh, where they're having a great deal of trouble and have had trouble with, uh, with uh, Islamic terrorists even today. And in the center, there are many small islands, Samar, Panay, and the island of Leyte. And it was the island of Leyte that marked the return of American armed forces on October the 20th, 1944. The Philippines were an American possession. We had acquired them at the end of the war with Spain in 1898. And then with uh, the Day of Infamy, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Japan attacked all of America's possessions throughout the Pacific. And they occupied the island of Guam, they conquered the island of Wake, and they seized the Philippine Islands. They invaded and occupied the Philippines. We had the, the, the Bataan Death March that people have heard of when American prisoners were marched, many of them to their death. Uh, and this was all um, after General Douglas MacArthur, who was our commander in the Philippines at the time, he was holed up in the island fortress of Corregidor in 1941 and into 1942 until President Roosevelt ordered him time and time again to leave. MacArthur was probably the best known American Army officer of the time and he was ordered to leave and finally he, he accepted the order of the Commander-in-Chief. So in 1944 he returned. He had made the pledge, I shall return. And, and that was a, a rallying cry. And American forces landed on October the 20th at Leyte Island. You've probably seen the, the uh, newsreel footage of MacArthur striding ashore. Uh, we had a reference today to how his, his trousers were soaked with water. The story is told he had the, the president of the Philippines because in the 1930s we had granted a great deal of self-government to the Philippines. They had their own Congress, they had their own legislature, and they had their own president whom they elected. And he arrived with MacArthur. And the story is that MacArthur turned to him and said, and said, well, the American people are going to learn that I cannot walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> so they strode ashore and MacArthur gave a broadcast, I have returned. And this, of course, began the liberation of the Philippines. Uh, my dad was, was a, a soldier in the 63rd Infantry Regiment of the 6th Infantry Division, which was part of MacArthur's command in the Pacific. I'm very proud of that fact, and, and his division, he later told me, I asked him about Leyte, and he said their division was in support of the Leyte invasion. They were, they were in reserve if we had <laughs> needed more American forces, but because the opposition was lighter than they had feared, uh, they did not have, his division did not have to go in. They landed on January the 9th of 1945, just a few months later, in the Lingayen Gulf on the main island of Luzon. My dad was involved in the the liberation of Manila. Uh, he saw Clark Field, which was the great American air installation which had been uh, taken by the Japanese. He fought on the Bataan Peninsula when we retook Bataan. Saw the island of Corregidor. He saw Corregidor but did not have to actually fight there. So I'm very proud of that fact. And I mention this because it's an important milestone in, in the, the Second World War in the Pacific. And just this year we had so much focus on, and rightly so, on D-Day. Uh, June the 6th, 1944, the 75th anniversary of the landings at Normandy, which began the liberation of Europe. Uh, the landings at Leyte were just as important to the Pacific War because they began the reoccupation of the Philippines, which was one of the primary reasons America was fighting, because that was, that was American territory. It was, it was scheduled to, to be given its independence, which it did in 1946. But MacArthur was, was as important to the war in Pacific as Dwight Eisenhower was to the war in Europe. And just about a week later, the great battle of Leyte Gulf was fought. So you had this, the army coming ashore with the uh, Army Air Force support. And then a week later, 
One of the greatest naval engagements of World War II is fought, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And the Japanese uh, tried, to, tried to drive the Americans out, and they sent their forces in three prongs, the south, the north, and in the center. And the southern forces fought a great battle at a place called the Surigao Strait, which is important because it was the last battleship engagement in naval history. It was the last time the two battle lines of dreadnoughts faced off against each other and exchanged salvos at each other. The interesting thing about the Surigao Strait, there were five American battleships there. Four of them were survivors of Pearl Harbor. Hmm. The West Virginia, the Maryland, the California, and the Tennessee, and also the Pennsylvania was there. Actually five, but it did not it did not engage. The Pennsylvania was in a position where it did not engage. But four of the ships that had been hit by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor were there to deliver the final death blow to the Japanese Navy. The Battle of Leyte Gulf in these three phases was a tremendous American victory. The Japanese lost three battleships, a large aircraft carrier, ten destroyers, including six, ten cruisers, excuse me, ten cruisers, including six heavy cruisers and American losses were very we lost one light carrier one smaller carrier several destroyers the casualties were totally disproportionate it was the end of the Japanese Navy as a striking force from then on in the Japanese Navy was no longer in a position to wage any significant combat in the Pacific and it, it's interesting because these these battle wagon survivors of Pearl Harbor that had been repaired and refloated were there to deliver this final coup de grace to the Imperial Japanese Navy in the final gunfire battle of, that, that will almost certainly ever be waged between battleships. So it's an important, and I wanted to take some time today, we're celebrating, we're in this 75th era, the era of the 75th anniversaries of World War II. It will come to an end, an end next year when we mark the, the final surrender of, of Germany, the 75th anniversary of VE Day, the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. Sure, there'll be a lot of talk about the Battle of the Bulge in December, the 75th anniversary of that. Did you realize Tokyo Rose lived in Chicago? That's right. I, I, I'm, I've heard that, that she was a Chicagoan. I talked to her. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she wouldn't go on the radio. Yeah, she, she had a place on Clark Street, didn't you? Yeah. Grocery, yeah. Not not Clark, Clark, yeah. The store that North Side, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, she said, how did you get my number? <laughs> we have ways. We yeah. have ways in the media. <laughs> so we're in this World War II anniversary. I wanted to pay a salute particularly to my dad because my dad was in support of that landing. And uh, to call to mind the fact that, uh, that the, the war in the Pacific is where the war began for the United States was Pearl Harbor. And there was a great deal of gallantry that took place all throughout the Pacific from our, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Coast Guard all that were involved in the war in the Pacific. And sometimes they just don't get the, the recognition you think of the Pacific, it's, you know, the landing at, at, uh, at uh, Iwo Jima, you know, the flag raising at Iwo Jima, the iconic uh, raising of the American flag at Mount Suribachi. And again, rightly, rightly so. And I remember my dad always saying, he was a soldier, but he always res he respected the Marines. He said the Marines, his, his comment on the Marines was the Marines got a lot of dirty assignments. No, the they, had, they had the great Marines PR, had a too. Lot of, a lot of dirty assignments. But just an opportunity to, to pay respect to, the, to those who fought in the Pacific in World War II and, and brought the final defeat to the Japanese Empire. Now the great thing that Chicago has contributed so much to the war effort over the years and during World War II, uh, we had four aircraft plants here. We had the Dodge Chrysler plant, which is, uh, became Ford City. It was actually right. the Tucker mm -hmm. Motor Car Company there yeah. for a little while. Uh, where the Tucker Torpedo was produced in 1948. Um, that they produced the uh, engines for the B-29, uh, Super Fortress, including uh, Enola Gay and Boxcar that uh, ended the war, or give them credit for ending the war. Uh, the Buick plant, which is uh, up right here at uh, Mannheim and uh, North Avenue, which became Navistar. That, was old, uh, that made uh, the engines for the B-24. Um, up at Orchard Field, the Douglas plant there, which made the C-54, and uh, the little-known Studebaker plant, which is right at Archer and Cicero, right north of what was the Chicago Municipal Field there. They actually made uh, uh, component parts and engine parts for the B-17. It was shipped off to uh, the Studebaker plant for final assembly in South Bend. Um, also, uh, the Hammond Organ Company, uh, and they made uh, caskets for the war. 
uh, okay. Wurlitzer plant out by us uh, uh, in Anaconda Wire and Cable out in Sycamore. They made uh, plywood and wooden aircraft components. The Victor Adding Machine Company, just uh, to the north and west of uh, WGN at, B at Bradley Place, the Victor Adding Machine Company mm -hmm. made the Norton bomb site. Rockwell so and Irving. The famous Rockwell Norton, Norton bomb yes, site. Yes, the fam they've made the famous Norton bomb site. Mm -hmm. uh, Amertorp, the American Torpedo Company, uh, they did actually, um, it became uh, Forest Park Mall. And uh, right uh, down the street, uh, that's where Gian kind of hung his hat there, because he Art made he made his big thing on supplying uh, uh, ladies for the war effort. <laughs> Our two airports have the World War II connection because Midway is named for the Battle of Midway, Midway and right. O'Hare is named for Butch O'Hare. So right, they're, 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 they're both named in honor of, of World mm -hmm. War II. Right. And they're sporting some aircraft that came up out of Lake Michigan too. So I that there were what sixty or seventy of them still down there. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they're as, government as property. They're government property, and as time goes along, you know, the even though it's fresh water, even though there's uh, low oxygen content down there, and the zebra mussels have, been, have done a lot of things to uh, the aircraft, they are in the in the process of disintegrating right. uh, slowly. Uh, I can remember driving down Cicero Avenue as a kid, and I remember my dad when pointing out the the what is today Ford City, with well, those those big industrial buildings and factories which were abandoned at that point. Nothing was happening there. And I can remember my dad saying that was where they, they built, that was, you know, a, a war production plant the motors, plant and mm -hmm. the motors for, for American bombers during right. World War and II. And in all of those motor plants and all the engine plants, they would take the motors, and when they put them on a test cell, they would run them for X amount of time, then they would break them down and run them again. During that initial break-in period, they used those uh, motors to power the plant. So those were actually being used in generation. Right. So if you see, you go in the back, which actually became Tootsie Roll after a while, in the back right. of Ford City, you'll right. see those stacks that are back there. Those were all the test cells. Yeah, for all they the were engines. just east of Pulaski. It was, it was on the east side of uh, uh, Cicero, about 7,900 south. Yeah. And if you look south. closely, you can still see Ford script on some of them. Yeah. yeah. And My mother told me that th she worked at Stuart Warner, and they did a lot of war work. And Stuart Warner actually was the first actual sponsor of WBBM programming. Oh, were they? Yeah, they, they, they actually bought the entire, uh, they leased the entire uh, uh, schedule that uh, Leslie Atlas had in 1925. Oh. Well, I wanted to ask you, because everybody knows that it's been News Radio 78. Well, they don't, they don't, they don't use that News Radio 78 as much anymore. But it's been the, it's been doing the all news format since 1968. They 68. Celebrated right. their 50th anniversary last year. Before that, and I, I sort of recall this, it was like a mixture of news and talk. It was radio. news talk during the mid 60s. But before the, that, what was it? Before you said it was it music. It was primarily that? music. Yes. Mm -hmm. What? Yes. What? Just just. Uh, uh, well, like like music wagon with Mal Belairs and the Boyd Twins and the Kings Jesters. That was their in-house singing group. Like pop and music of the mm -hmm. time. It, it, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, 50s. Uh, uh, their 40s. 50s. Yeah, the the music of the. Of the era, you you had big band music, you had swing music, you had you broadcast live from the Aragon and the Trianon and all the rest of the, the big palace. Uh, but they uh, did remotes. Rooms. Yes, they mm -hmm. did remotes. Yes, and they would have actually they their sound truck with all the disc lathes and everything out there was would actually park out in front, and it was a kind of a airflow looking trailer house trailer on the back of a, like a big Packard or something one of those big sedans, and it said WBBM Air Theater on the side there. Yeah. It was a portable studio. Let me mention another another well-known name in our final minutes. Pierre Andre was oh, a well-known yeah. Chicago yeah. broadcaster. Mm -hmm. broadcaster. Mm -hmm. My mom was at the Edgewater Beach Hotel with her cousins and girlfriends uh, and Pierre Andre was going to go on the air. They did a live broadcast from the Edgewater <laughs> Beach Hotel and j there, my mom and where they were at a table right near where he wa where his podium was, where he was going to broadcast from <laughs> and a bug, a bee, or it was in the spring. <laughs> the, the weather was it, it landed yeah, it was right on right down her, there on the on the lake. Too. Landed on her shoulder, and her cousin <laughs> pointed at it, and my mom <laughs> screamed. <laughs> and just as they went on the air, and so he went on the air, and when they went to the station break, he walked over to my mom and he said, "Young lady, I want you to know that you had the first voice on the air today. They heard you <laughs> scream before I begin went into my announcement." And she started. We said, "No, don't worry about it. It's no problem." She was. She thought she was going to get you know. 
<laughs> reprimanded for this. He says, no, no, don't worry about it. But I just wanted you to know, you were the first voice everyone heard today on the radio. And where the band was at, at the Edgewater Beach, they had a big fan that would be up, and it would the fan would just fold open, and there would be the band right behind it. There. Pierre it really Andre, cool. he was the announcer for the hip parade. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That right? And, and, and he right? also married a gal by the name of B. Wayne. That's right. Who was a vocalist with Larry Clinton. That's right. Green Eyes. <laughs> no, no. That was just Jimmy that Dorsey. Yeah, I mean, but she sang Green Eyes, though, didn't she? Well, she might have. Yeah. I've, yeah. Got, I've got an interview yeah. with her, and mm -hmm. she's in pretty good shape. And another, na <laughs> uh, uh, and another I name. I never played it on the radio. Tommy oh. Dorsey was the sentimental gentleman. Wasn't sentimental he? gentleman of swing. That was, yeah. that was yeah. Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey, Dorsey was uh, Jimmy Dorsey. Just he didn't have and, any, well, any uh, embellishment. Well, Mayor Byrne was here. Uh, she used to have me do a lot of hosting of the park concerts. Remember those? They used to have sure, in the park. Sure. So I worked with the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra as the announcer, and Lee Castle was the leader. Lee Castle was raised by the Jimmy Dorsey family, the Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey family in, in Pennsylvania. And I asked Lee, I said, what was it that Jimmy and Tommy were always arguing about? And he said, growing up with those guys, he said the, the only thing that they would argue about was tempo. It wasn't that they didn't like each other. Jimmy thought it should be this tempo, Tommy thought mm. it should be this tempo, and they always argued. So they went their separate ways. And it was really interesting working with him at Olive Park. As a matter of fact, that day, the day before, a woman calls me at the radio station. She says, Denny Farrell? And it's Denny. I said, yes. She says, I don't like you, <laughs> and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> okay. Well, don't hold I'm, back. Oh, I'm sure what you really think. think. I said, well, <laughs> what, what seems to be the problem? I said, you know, she took me by surprise. <laughs> I said, I like you. Yeah. And I'm talking to her and trying to admit, no, I don't like you, and I'm going to kill you. I know you're going to be at Olive Park tomorrow afternoon with Mayor Byrne, and I'm going to shoot you. And in our business, hmm. did you ever see the movie Play Misty for me? Oh, yeah, sure. Take that for real, because I've had that happen. Not well, quite as bad as mm. Clint Eastwood, yeah, but uh, at a jazz station in L.A. And uh, she said, no, I'm going to kill you. I said, listen, I said, I want to be your friend. Now I'm trying to play her. I said... I've got to do a commercial. Can you hold on? Give me your phone number. Let me call you right back so I can, uh, mm. so we can be friends. So she gave me the phone number. No. I ID'd it. The Chicago PD was already on the line with the radio station. Mm. And within 10 minutes, they called back the station. We got her. It wasn't they were worried about me getting shot. It was Mayor Byrne. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Gentlemen, we can do, do away with the disc jockey. <laughs> yeah, nothing. What? I'm an announcer. Chicago had guy. one mayor shot in, in the process of yeah. an assassination when, when uh, Adam Cermak was shot yeah. with yeah. the yeah. man aiming at FDR. So they oh, might yeah. have been aiming at you and hit Jane Byrne. Oh, yeah. Instead. Oh, yeah. Well, I hosted a thing at uh, uh, right next to WGN. I can't remember the name of the hotel on, on Michigan Avenue. That real nice hotel. Uh, Radio stations were invited, and there were a lot of celebrities there, and I was the MC. The Allerton? It's, 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 it's the same side of the street as WGN used to be on. Yeah, right next door. The east side, yeah, right next door. Drake, yeah. the Allerton? Uh, so, Blackstone? Mayor Byrne comes up to me. Well, it was a hotel under Continental, I think. Mayor Byrne, the Continental, that's right. It. Mayor Byrne comes up to me and says, why don't you introduce a couple of the celebrities that are here? I said, okay. So I've got a list, and I'm saying so-and-so. There are cops in it. Staff, take a bow. Stands up. You know. I get down to Sheriff Elrod. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, Sheriff Elrod, stand up, take a bow. Oh. Oh, oh come on, stand up, take a bow. <laughs> that, that. And Mayor Byrne comes up and whispers, he can't. He's paralyzed. <laughs> oh. yeah. I, when he was shot that New Year's Eve, I was in Nam. I was in Vietnam. So I'd, I had you didn't no know. clue. I didn't know that he was. Nobody yeah. told me. It wasn't even on my notes. So watch your mouth before you open it with a big crowd. You're in company with Joe Biden because he, he famously did the yeah, same yeah, thing with yeah, a fellow. He's introducing a fellow up. who was paralyzed yeah, and couldn't. Yeah. Stand up, Joe. Oh, really? Joe can't stand up. Okay, let's all stand up for Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but Biden said there's that a, guy was his good friend. There's so a tongue twister that you can try if you want to work out and really <laughs> work with your voice. Uh, you go, try it now. One smart feller, he felt smart. Two smart fellers both felt smart. Three smart fellers all felt smart. Now you try it. One smart feller, he felt smart. One, one smart feller, he f he's. Say it again. <laughs> one smart feller, he felt smart. One smart feller, he felt smart. Two smart fellers both felt smart. Two smart fellers both felt smart. Three smart fellers all felt smart. Three smart fellers all felt smart. Okay, anybody else want to try it? 
<laughs> Chris, Come on, Chris. My WBBM news time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I have I have one more question to ask you, Chris. Do you remember another gentleman that was uh, uh, what what the WEDC? That was the um, uh, Edgewater Beach Hotel radio no, station. A, what's his name from? Buddy Black. Yeah, yeah, Buddy Black. Yeah, come over and visit with us all the time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, I don't. Yeah. You were working in town at that time. No, no. Yeah. no, no. Uh, yeah, Buddy Black. Buddy Black used to uh, broadcast from Riverview Park on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at eight o'clock, and they had like a little garage where, where was their, their remote studios. And when I found out about it, what I did is I went home, took my clock radio, took my tape recorder, <laughs> set it at 8 o'clock, go over to Riverview Park. Hi, everybody. We're from Riverview Park. We used to stand and scream and holler and go home and listen to us on, on the tape. <laughs> yeah, buddy was a nice guy. Yes, he sure was. Yeah, he yes, was a great he sure guy. Was. He was at WLS all the time. Uh-huh, yeah. Gentlemen, I just want to go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Just uh, talking about listening to yourself. When I first started overnight on WMAQ doing the, the traffic on shadow traffic, like everybody, we had a uh, individual <laughs> radios that were tuned to the stations that we were all on, and we would all race out there and make our own own tape yeah. so we could sit at home and listen to what went right, what went wrong, <laughs> and uh, or you just erase, bulk erase everything that, if it was that bad. That doing the don'ts. That's it. Yeah. yeah, you could see how you sounded on the air. Yeah. Well, I had my wife tape me every night on the yeah. all night show. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, eight hours of. I was on from ten at night till six in the morning. Oh. John, kudos to the or kudos to the studio for the decorations. Yes, <laughs> yes. 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 Our, our underground co command center here, the John DeVita Broadcast Center, <laughs> my backyard, is festooned with <laughs> harvest <laughs> and Halloween for, decorations. Right. Uh, and for, for the holidays here, we, we spare no expense. Yes, yeah. and again, we regret that those of you listening can't come down and see these lavish decorations. But once again, yeah. you just have to go through so many checkpoints and barbed wire entanglements; it's not worth it. We're coming to the end of our, our right. broadcast. John, I just I just want to say, today has been a great honor for me in radio broadcasting. Having two icons here. Here, here. here, here. Uh, uh, Chris no, and, and, and Denny, I t right. this, this, is, this is one of the happiest days of my life, I, I must say. And listening to Chris coming in from Wisconsin this morning, and uh, uh, Denny, uh, who's been very... Well, you really should listen to me up in Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. On Sunday mornings, I used to listen to you at yeah. a station out of Beloit. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. there. Yeah, but anyways, this there. this was a great a great honor having yeah, every yeah, having is, everybody here. Great guys, thanks thanks for Thank being you. here. Thanks for, yeah, being now, for having us. Now I just have one little thing to say, gentlemen. We are not going to be taping Meet the Chicago Historians next um, next month, next November, because November the twelfth, I'm going to be occupying a bed in Resurrection Hospital to get my knee uh, taken care of. Uh, I talked myself out of it for the past three years or better. Now I'm to the point where it's got to get done. And I, to be honest with you, I wish it was tomorrow uh, because to I'm, in, I'm, I'm in so much sure. pain. Come up here and lay down. <laughs> okay, I'll be right there <laughs> then. We'll Clear the table. So, I got, I got but my again, knife with me. <laughs> again, Chris, thank you very much. It was a great honor to, 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 to be shaking the hands to somebody I hear, I hear on that little speaker inside my, my truck or in my bedroom. Well, Benny, it's nice to you. get my legs back again. Being all cramped <laughs> up inside that dashboard really is <laughs> if you wearing on to me. the Big Band Hall of Fame. So There's a picture of myself, Cliff Mercer, and several other band leaders, Count Basie and all of them. Very good. So, nice. Once again today, folks, we want to thank. We've had uh, Dennis Farrell, who was with WJJ. D and many other stations. WXFM when it was before WBBM. Okay. 105.9. Oh. Not, not, yes. not our founding station, WJJG, but WJJD. D, D is and in Delta. <laughs> and we're glad to have him. And Chris Habermill, who is the, the traffic reporter for WBBM News Radio 78, as they used to call it. 78. We've really appreciated your being here and talking about the history of Chicago broadcasting. Let's give each of our panelists a quick opportunity to once again acknowledge themselves. I did. Don Peter from Oak Park, and I enjoyed myself immensely. Very much. Very good. Dennis Fitzgerald, Tower Chicago Police. We're glad to be here today. What an exceptional program. Outstanding. Bill Kugelman from the Fire Department, from the Fire Museum, and yes, this was a good, good Two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Tom McKenna, and once again, thanks for coming, guys. We, it was a treat. And our announcer. Rich Lang. Nothing's better than old-time radio.
Thanks for being here. This has been our October Harvest Edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. We will not be here in November. There won't be a Thanksgiving edition, but we'll be back in December for our Christmas party here at the John DeVita Broadcast Center. So thanks for listening. Have a very happy Halloween. Have a blessed Armistice Day, Veterans Day, and a happy Thanksgiving, the great American holiday, that great festival of Thanksgiving. And we will be back in December. And I'll... This is John Escachoco thanking you for being here today from the John DeVita Broadcast Center. Thanks again to our special guests, Chris and Dennis. And I'll turn it over to our announcer for our final words. Final announcement. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening pleasure via the Internet at www.windycityhometown.com. We want to especially thank the executive direct producer, of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, John Seconda. On behalf of everyone associated with our historian's programs, we thank you for listening and a great early holiday season to each of you. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. So long, until next time. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 21st of the year, 2019. This broadcast was produced and directed by John DeVita and our special thanks to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. Until next time, please be safe and thanks for listening.